All right, I'll I'll start it off. Okay. Welcome, welcome to the fiftieth episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. Holy shit! I can't believe it. We made it to fifty episodes. Thank you for being here with us. My name is Heather Powell, and I am one half of your hosting team, coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, is Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek, in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. <laughs> Fully vaxxed, waxed, boosted, and ready to climax. And if you can, please get me wet, feed me after midnight, and let's celebrate 50 episodes together. I actually got a little emotional doing that intro, Scott. I almost started crying. Aww. As well, so Scott and I, as we all know, are very close friends. Um, I think people are aware from the visits that Scott has been able to do due to COVID. I visited him private pre previously before COVID. We were talking last night um, how, you know, it's hard to believe this pre-COVID world existed. It's two years into the pandemic. Um, and so much has changed in Scott and I's life since meeting each other. Yeah. And it's, it's very special in life when you meet a friend that you can be so close with, even if it's virtual. So, Agreed. right. Um, Scott and I have not been alone on this podcast since we tell horror. I mean, wow, that was the last yeah. time, right? Um, that was over a month, two months ago when we, decided that we would do top five episodes with some of our great special guests. So again, a big thank you to Matt from the internal darkness of the not so spotless, spotless mind, mind podcast. Uh, big thank you to Lanks Lanford from the horror returns and a big thank you to Tim Davis and Daniel Luffy from horror for dummies. And also a shout out to Gary Hill from cinema beef for being on our top fives with us. And Brandon Orlick, of course, who joined us from the Exploding Heads podcast for our awards. Um, it's been yeah. a ride. Yeah, it's been crazy these last these last two months with like what we've done. Like we haven't done like our normal episode and it feels like so long. And once again, we're still not doing our normal style episode today. No, um, because we're at our 50th episode and we steal from Exploding Heads movie podcast all the time. Um, <laughs> shouts out to the Exploding Heads movie podcast. Please subscribe on Patreon if you're not only uh, not already a member. Um, we will be going over our top 50 personal horror movies. So this obviously is in a list of the movies we think are the absolute best. Who the fuck are Scott and I to decide what <laughs> movies are the absolute best? These are the movies that we really value and really, really like. Um, just as a side note, thank you to all those people that watched our live video back at New Year's time. So Scott did come up uh, from the 30th to the 1st to celebrate New Year's with me and my friends. And I thought we had a pretty good time considering the blast. restrictions. Uh, Scotty and I went to Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto. And it's always such like when Scott and I get together, it's literally like seeing my brother. Um, yeah. And it's probably people hear that and they're like male female relationship. That's still weird. But like, I love Scott. Scott is like my, my blood and we are very, very close and we go through a lot of hard times together and support each other. And we have a very similar personality. Um, and, you know, having him up here and doing the fun touristy things that, you don't do when you've lived somewhere for so long. Right. It was really, really fun. So. Yeah. I was like, cause like, and once again, you know, it was a visit that was pretty much go, go, go. Like, cause we had yes. a small amount of time. Cause I had, uh, yes. I had to leave early Saturday morning to beat the big snowstorm that was coming uh, my way in Michigan. Cause I didn't want to be on the road when I got caught in that. And yeah, I'm glad I didn't. Cause it was pretty nasty. And, yeah. I'm uh, glad that you got home safely. Yeah. But man, so much that we did in such a small amount of time. I mean, we went out for uh, all you can eat sushi shortly after I got there. Yeah. And, oh my God, that was amazing. And then we went to Dave and Buster's that night. Yeah. Kicked your ass in air hockey again. You sure yeah. did. And first time you've been at a David Buster's, like, let's acknowledge that. Like, <laughs> right. You know, and I had probably one of the grossest pina coladas I've ever drank. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and we went to this, like, little hobby shop, and it was, like, this collector that had all this shit. Like, it was kind of like a hoarder. Um, and it was really, it was cool. Like, it was cool to do that stuff with Scotty. Scotty digs yeah. doing shit like that, and I dig doing shit like that, too. Um, <clears throat> so it's always nice, and we can 
reconnect and do things. And I've been boosted as well. So yeah. I'm uh, all as vaxxed as one can be vaxxed, I guess you could say. And we will be hopefully moving into an amdemic is what the word is on the street. And hopefully we get rid of the PCR test or at least make it so it's a three-day rule applies again that yeah. you can cross the border for three days with a negative test and come back. That would be a fucking heaven sent because then I could actually go out and see Scotty. That would be awesome. Right. Even though yeah. it's way more fun at my house, but that's fine. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, uh, for the ones that don't know, Americans have to just get one COVID test, one, have to have one negative COVID test and be vaccinated across the border. And you can stay in Canada as long as you like and come back. And that's all you do is that one COVID test. Where Canadians have right now at the moment has have to have one before they leave to get a negative test across the border. And then they have to get a negative test coming back. And yeah. it's there's free ones, but those ones take too long for like your short visits that yeah. you'd be planning on doing so you'd have to pay 150 bucks out of pocket or more yeah american yeah so it's like a grand canadian <laughs> right <laughs> so it's it's unfortunate that um i haven't been able to go see scott but it's been kind of nice that scott comes here because he has his own bedroom here he has been able to hang out with my friends so much so that we actually had him play virtual Monopoly with us last night. Yeah, that um, was fun. We, yeah, we said it's got one too. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I did. <laughs> Me rolling for him and collecting his money and buying property somehow. And I would just like ask him whatever he wanted me to do. He could see the board and we would go through and it was, it was, it was, it was fun. Like we played for about three hours. So it was pretty, pretty good. I thought it went, you know, pretty well considering it was all virtual. Yeah, like I, I had a great time and I was getting a nice little buzz on, had a couple of beers. <laughs> Now, I just want to shout out something. Um, Scott already has his number one of 2022, and that is Scream 5. So, Absolutely, Scott, would you yeah. mind telling us how great Scream 5 is? Like, without spoilers, of course, because Dave C. may be listening. Um, oh, I think he's already seen Scream 5. But Well, either way, there's still a lot of people that probably don't want spoilers. Yeah, so tell us about, like, what would you say? Like, do you think the Academy Award that I made for Scream 3, I should just cross out 3 and add 5? Absolutely. No. Okay. This, uh, <laughs> This, like, people know that I'm not the biggest fan of the Scream franchise in the first place. Like, mm -hmm. I like the first one, and I like the second one. Part three, I could care less, and part four is okay. And part five, for me, is just above part three in the ranking, which is second to last. And, yeah, I went into this one, like, hoping for, like, something new for the franchise, but it just felt like re rehashing old tricks that the first film did. I mean, obviously, if you're a huge fan of the franchise, you'll find a lot of Easter eggs that will like give nods to other of the other movies. But all in all, this was just, eh. Like, even uh, the person I went with that's, you know, a bigger fan of Scream than I am, the movie was over, and she looked over and goes, well, that was a movie. Ah, <laughs> and, ha, ha. But we both yeah. figured out the killer, like, the the killer right away like right in the beginning like they made it too obvious and yeah just rehash shit that it just yeah like if you're a huge fan i say definitely go see it but for someone that's just kind of like middle of the road like me yeah you can wait yeah that's that's a fair statement movie theaters are closed here they open on january 31st we're recording this on the 23rd so I may go see it at the theater, just have something to do. Right. But I said this last year, and I stand by Ugh. it. We didn't need a Scream 5. Um, I think Scream 4 was a perfect way to end the franchise. I don't think it's a franchise that needs to keep going on and on. I don't think it's the same as something like Halloween. I feel like because Halloween, you have a distinct killer that you can plop into various situations and people can go for a fun slasher. I really do think that's different than constantly changing up who ghost faces all the time. Like, the first couple were fine. I got screamed for, I understood the concept with the family connection in it. That made a lot more sense to me. Like I get how, and what they were playing on was social media and fame and shit like that. Like I, I understood right. the point of four and, but you know, I, I, I get it. We all need paydays and you know, I'm not going to criticize you if you really liked Scream 5. I, I totally respect everyone's opinion. I just don't think that a movie like that was necessary. I really don't. And I no. love the Scream franchise. I do. It's it's some of my favorite films. <sighs> we might hear about some of them today. But it's honestly, like, it's every movie's the same. <laughs> yeah. And and you're and you are absolutely right about the killer because for one how many times is there going to be a copycat ghost face killer how many times are we going to see this over and over and over again for crying out loud 
It's like, right. like at least with like Michael Myers and Jason and Freddy and Pinhead and all them, it's like they are like unstoppable forces of nature. Basically. Yeah, and like that's their role. Pinhead's role is he's going to fucking torture you and bring you to hell. That's that's his fucking shit. Jason's pissed off that he drowned and that his mom got deheaded and he's fucking shit up. Like yeah. he's going to fuck shit up for the rest of his life. I feel like with Scream, like I, I don't get me wrong. I did enjoy the plot lines between the first three. I, I did like, you know, who the killer reveal is that's family related at the end of two. I did like the plot line that they put together at the end of three. And I didn't mind the fourth of it was also family. Yeah. But at some point you got to be like, okay, we've, and, and personally, I watch the Scream television series. It's meant for teenagers, everybody. So don't criticize it that hard. I enjoyed it because it was different. Right. There were some cool kills in it. And it was a fun little drama series that I could turn my fucking brain off and watch. <clears throat> Right. And I don't need to walk into everything and it doesn't need to be a fucking A24 film. So, you know, it's okay to just have some bubblegum horror that you sit and watch. But I just, anyway, when you told me about that, Scotty, I was like, I fucking knew it. And like, the worst part is, I guess, one of the killers by looking at the IMDb actors. Yep. How bad <laughs> is that? That I could guess who one of them was from just looking at their picture. Because it's the same shit every film. Anyway. Not yeah. to shit on Scream. I love Scream. We're going to hear about it later today, but I just knew Scotty went to the theater to see it, so I had to give him an opportunity to praise his love for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> it was an experience, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm glad I went to the theater because, you know, I always enjoy going to the theater, watching movies. So yeah. I'm glad I still got to do that. But at the same time, it's like, eh, I've seen better. When I come to see you one day, we should, or you come here, we should get fucking high and go see a movie hell yeah i am down <laughs> he's so fucking obnoxious oh <laughs> the last time i was like that was me and <laughs> me and my buddy we got uh we were working third shift and the job that i was working was uh on the it was on a weekend so on the weekends you could go in and as long as you started it by friday and were done by monday morning it didn't matter how long you took. You could go, you could work two hours and go, all right, I'm going to come back on Saturday, finish the rest. So on a Friday night, him and I were working together cleaning and we realized that there was a showing in about a half hour for Team America. And we're like, oh, hell yeah, let's, let's just stop work right now. Let's go freaking get baked and go see Team America <laughs> and then come back to work. That's so amazing. We packed a bowl of this really good shit, and him and I, the theater is only five minutes from where we worked, so we just power smoked it the whole way there. Like, we finished off an entire bowl in five minutes, walked oh, in the man. theater, bought the tickets, sat down, and we were laughing our asses off and were being so loud that we did not realize that the 10 people that were in the theater, all but like two had gotten up and left because either because we were being so obnoxious or because they just didn't like the movie. But Oh my God. Well, it's oh. probably a combination between not knowing what that movie was and you two fucking obnoxious assholes sitting there. Oh, we were just laughing our asses off. It, we were in tears. <laughs> oh God, Scotty. That's really funny. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. I, uh, man, <laughs> anyway, we should do that together. Hell yeah, Absolutely. I'm down. Absolutely. Well, I guess we'll drop, we'll jump into our top 50 movies, but thank you everyone for supporting us to make it to episode 50. Never in a million fucking years did I ever think I would A, be a podcaster, B, be working with someone as awesome as Scotty, Aww. and C, <laughs> make it to 50 episodes of just talking right. about movies. <laughs> Which not only is this our 50th episode, but it's also our two-year anniversary episode, technically, as well. It is. Two years ago, we started recording, and so much has changed in that time. I've finished my master's degree. Fuck Yay, yeah. Congratulations. Thank so happy and proud of you. Fucking God, that shit's over. I've been ghosted, um, <laughs> which... <laughs> Aww. That happened recently. That's actually my top 50 of scariest movie, my DMs. <laughs> yep. Scotty can relate. <laughs> being, ghosted, being ghosted sucks. I've been there, okay. done that way too many times over my He like, also has years. that in his top 50 of the <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, but you know who don't who doesn't ghost each other? You and I. You and I would never no. ghost each other ever. Never, never, never. Even when this fucker's been up in the UP, I hear from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you get no break from me. Well, and I want to do some big traveling this year. Um, this is a really big year for me. I'm gonna be honest. I'm turning 39, and besides this podcast, which has been a great achievement, knowing Scotty, another great achievement. 
Um, it's true though. It's true. It's a hundred percent true, Scott. Uh-huh. Like, you know, you're, you're a very important part of my life and you know that. So, yeah. and I was like, what the hell's Heather doing? She's not making fun of Scott. Don't worry. That will come. That will come. <laughs> Wait till we talk about the, the movies. <laughs> Wait till we talk about a gremlins number fucking 49 to one over and over. It'll be the quickest <laughs> episode ever. Um, but I do plan on doing a big trip this year. And I was trying to decide between England and Ireland. And I, I'm planning on going to Ireland. So if we have any Irish listeners out there, I was relying on somebody to give me information. I have a feeling I will not hear from that person again. So if you're from Ireland, can you please message me? Um, I would, I'm looking at staying in Dublin and I would love to have someone tell me how much food would cost and other such things. So if you're part of the Friday Nightmares Facebook page, you can find me on there. I'm one of the admins. Feel free to message me. Um, I'm just, yeah, I really, and if you want to meet up, um, as I said, I'll be coming to stay in Dublin and I plan on doing some trips outside of there. I'd love for Scotty to come with me, but I don't think it's in Scotty's, uh, realm at this moment. No, not right now. I mean, unfortunately, right. unless I win the lottery, then he's definitely coming with me. Yeah. So I'll be paying for him <laughs> to come, but we have to take different flights because I'm not going to the fucking States to fly to Ireland. You're going to have to fly to Dublin and I'm going to have to meet you there. And I know you're going to be scared, but it's going to be fine. I'll meet you at the airport. Mm-mm. That's fair. Um, Right. So anyway, if anyone is from Ireland and they're able to give me some advice, I would really, really appreciate it. Please reach out to me at Friday Nightmares. You can find me there. My name's Heather Powell on Facebook. Look me up, send me a message. And, you know, maybe we can meet up too while we're there and talk about horror movies. So anybody, please. I am I was relying on someone and I don't know where that happened to them. So I'm right. really hoping that <laughs> someone else can reach out to me and that would make my life a lot easier. So that's my big thing that I'm planning on doing this year. Um, among other things, one of my, one of my other New Year's resolution was to unfriend haters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't know what happens when I'm the one that gets unfriended. Am I the hater? <laughs> that works. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that. Oh, thanks, Scott. So anyway, that's that's it for me. Scott, is there anything you want to say before we jump into our... Well, since you were anyway. speaking about traveling, like, I'm actually in July, we'll have three weeks paid vacation, so I'm hoping that, you know, I may actually be able to, maybe not travel out of country, but at least travel to some states that I've always wanted to go to. Like, hey, you know, maybe we have, could go together. More fun. Yeah. Right? If COVID's better, I, I could always come to Michigan, and then we could leave from there. Right. Like, right? yeah, I, there's always, like, there's things I'd like to be able to do, and, you know, let Scotty cut loose and have fun. Absolutely, right? So, it may not be Ireland, maybe New Jersey to see Brandon, but it's still... <laughs> It's and maybe awesome. and maybe one of these days we can go see our hunky boys in Aussie. Oh man, that was you know what though that's a long flight, but it honestly, <laughs> I would totally be down. That's actually on my bucket list. Um, I there's three countries that I would really like to go to: Ireland, England, and Australia. Um, yeah. and I'm planning on trying to do that in my lifetime. So hopefully this year's Ireland. So all you Irish Irish people out there, please message me. <laughs> I have so many questions and Expedia <laughs> and Google is great, but there's nothing like talking to someone who actually lives in the country right. and that can actually give me some information. So yeah, exactly. please do, if you can, if you hear this, um, you can just look me up on the Facebook. So I guess should we dump, jump into the 50th movies? Do you want to start, Scott? Yeah. So um, the way I ended up making this list, obviously it's our top 50 favorite horror films, just to make it easier for me, because this top 50 list was a lot of work and really difficult because I started off with taking my top 100 that I had written down a long time ago from when I was on the Horror Drunks podcast. And then since then, I've obviously seen way more movies that I've never seen before. So I added to the list. And by the time I had added everything that I liked enough to be on a list, I was at about 200 films and had to whittle this thing down to 50 and then order everything. So I'm just going to say right now, there is no 2021 horror films on here just for the fact that I, it's a fresh year. I don't know where these movies will land officially on my list by the, you know, I got to watch them a few more times before I'd make that decision. Um, Then also with the major franchises like Hellraiser, fucking Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, all the big ones that have had more than more than three movies. I have only picked one from each of the franchises just to kind of help limit what I had and like be able to give other movies a shout out as well. Um, but with that being said, I guess I will start with my number 50. And that film is from 2006 and one that actually Heather and I had watched together online a long time ago, shortly (laughs) after, I think it was still while we could see each other in person before the pandemic happened. Um, And that's 2006, Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon. Ah, I remember. (laughs) I remember. 
I a great just, movie. I love this movie. It's a great mockumentary, like half mockumentary, half slasher film. And the concept of following around this uh, serial killer that's basically like, you know, Jason and all the other icons of the horror industry. Uh, just following him around on his day-to-day routine, very meta and like just kind of like poking fun at like how people like uh, how come they always choose the virgin and how come they always uh, have like what how they choose their final girl and their Ahabs and like how he prepares for the final chase sequences and how he does all the traps and like you know, all the all the tropes of the slasher film and how he does them. And then it goes into the like, later the last half of the film turns into a slasher film and I just love the way this is done. Nathan Basil, I believe, is the character who play or the guy who plays Leslie Vernon, and I just think he's very charismatic and also very intimidating when he decides to turn on the killer mode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of like an indie darling in our horror movie industry, wor- like the horror movie world. But I just freaking love this film so much. It's so well done, and it's interesting how it goes from a documentary to a slasher. It's yeah. just a really, really clever film. And I was really glad that you exposed me to it. Um, Before I met Scott, honestly, I hadn't watched, like I've watched a lot of the popular movies, but I hadn't really expanded my knowledge. Now I feel like, you know, a little bit of a cinephile sometimes. Right. (laughs) Cinephile is what I said, everybody, just so we're clear. Um, Because I've watched so many movies now. I think in the past two years, I've watched almost, almost 700 movies, close to. Um, and I think that really has helped expand, you know, my, my knowledge of horror films. And this was a really, really good one that you brought to the table. So I thank you for getting me to see it. And I totally get why it's sitting at number 50. Yeah, it's just a great film. And I'm glad that, yeah, I'm glad you dug it when I introduced it to you because I had a feeling you would. Oh yeah, it was awesome. Um, for me, so my top 50 went pure on emotion, you know, what I enjoy, whether they're the best 50 horror movie films of all time. That's not really what this is about. It's about our own personal list yeah. of what we enjoy. So my number 50 is the Belco experiment, 2016. Oh, nice. um, this was a first time watch for me last year. And I thought the concept was fucking brilliant. Uh, you take an office building and you have a group of people that have worked together for years, never suspected anything. You're in a country where laws are a little more loose, we'll say, when it comes to human rights. And you turn them against each other and you see how people react. And this movie, to me, reflected exactly how people would react. Mm -hmm. Um, The roles that people took on, the way that it almost became like a Lord of the Flies kind of situation. And some of the kills, because you find out, this is a little bit of a spoiler, that people have chips emplaced in their heads and that they could explode at any minute. And you spend a lot of that movie feeling anxious Mm -hmm. over if someone's going to explode. Like, not, it's kind of like, reminds me a little bit of Spontaneous, only like, which I felt that way in that movie too. Like, are people going to explode at any given time? Right. And the Belko experiment made me feel that as well. Now the Belko experiment came first. And the ending of this movie was totally like, yeah, that's that's what you would fantasize would want to have happen. But then you would realize that this is bigger than you. So I think this horror movie incorporated capitalism, corporations, human behavior fucking excellently and i recommend it to anyone who has not had a chance to see it yet that is a great choice and man what a mean movie too mean very mean um really really well done so yeah, like, 40 na- sorry go ahead i would not have uh, i that is one that i would not have uh, thought of because i completely forgot that you had watched that last year yeah so that's what's going to be interesting about our list is I think there's going to be very few similar movies. I think there might yeah. be a couple, like some big franchises, but I think that what Scott and I gravitate towards is really going to come out in this list. Oh, definitely. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's a great movie. Definitely one of my uh, surprises of the year that when that came out. Well, and you know, honestly, if I hadn't watched the movies I had now, like this list, there's going to be movies on here that people are going to be like, really? I'm going to be like, yeah, man. Like, and that's what happens when you watch everything now. Yeah. Like... <laughs> you know you you get exposed to other stuff so that a great choice though um so yeah i guess i'll go with my number 49 and speaking of uh big franchises here's one of them uh, nice this is 1988's child's play nice great film chris is oh. my boyfriend yeah um, <laughs> absolutely but, but man uh the concept between behind this film at the time especially was just amazing the whole like you know it's shortly after the whole cabbage patch like big thing like and everybody wanted to get a cabbage patch doll and fight for it so they you know they created a good guy doll and the fact that yeah toy come to life yeah we've seen it before but mm-hmm. the whole there's a reason that this franchise is a franchise and that mm-hmm. is 
I would say, because of Brad Doris voicing Chucky. He yeah. gives Chucky this, like, mean-spirited personality, and Chucky is manipulative as shit and is great at, like, basically, like, this movie basically plays on the whole, is the doll really alive, or is or did Andy, is Andy Barkley doing these killings? And Chucky plays yeah. with that the whole entire time, and I yeah. love that about him as a yeah. character, because he knows he can get away with it and just be like, nope, I'm a doll. I'm not really here. Right. And I And it's one of those films that creeped me out as a kid, still has, like, some very creepy moments, and the whole concept of voodoo being used to transfer your soul into a doll sounds really just ridiculous and dumb but when yep. it's actually done on screen it actually like is really good and well done and the performances in this are amazing and yeah like i said brad dorf always will steal the show as chucky like, agreed he's just when he gets angry and starts screaming especially the when the mother goes to take the battery or go yeah, to check the batteries bitch, in the back, i'm gonna just, fucking kill you oh yeah oh man like and he just starts freaking out like and i i've always heard yeah. the argument Oh, why is someone so scared of a doll? They could just throw him, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, they can throw him, but he's also still has the strength of a grown adult man. Well, also, yeah. if a doll came to fucking life, don't give me this shit. You would be fucking kissing your pants, okay? Yeah. Like, I'll be, oh, I would do this or not. No, you wouldn't. Stop it. Right. All right? It's, it's like the people that criticize a fucking quarterback in the Super Bowl game who, yeah. like, played high school football. Fuck right. off. Right? <laughs> like, you have no idea what you would do if you were in that situation. So I agree. And the special effects hold up today. Yes. That is the impressive thing about this film. You can watch it now in 2022 and be like, oh, fuck, that's not, it's not cheesy. No, like the doll, like, like it's not. the animatronics for the doll is incredible. Incredible. And like, you know, it's a really sweet performance. Who's the guy that plays Andy, Andy Barkley? Oh, uh, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I can't remember. Everyone knows who he is. Everyone knows who goes to conventions, but it's a really good film. It's a really like great concept of what if we took this doll and made it evil and coming to life. And it spawned, obviously, a franchise of mixed reviews of how people feel about some of them. You know, some people are big fans, some people are not. Um, yep. Well, and while we're on it, I do have to say, if you haven't watched the Chucky TV series that came out this year, or this last year, do yourself a favor and watch it. Yeah, I gotta get on that. It's amazing. Yeah, I gotta get on that. I haven't seen that. I I think I've managed to watch all the Chucky ones now, except for the baby one. Um, oh, see the, the Chucky? Only, and then yeah, you, the only you don't really need to. Yeah, I finally watched the one where him and Tiffany get married. Uh, that's funny. That one's fun. Yeah, that one's, yeah, that comical, one's fun, right? Um, and uh, fuck, who's in that? Julia Stiles? Oh, no, Catherine Hagel. Yeah, Catherine, Catherine Hagel. Hagel's yeah. in it. Yeah, I was like, oh, fuck, shit. That's crazy. <laughs> um, great one. Great classic, classic yeah. 1980s film. Um, I'm going to keep it a little more modern. This was a film festival film that was, appeared in TIFF in 2017. It's a little known film on Shutter. I recommend people check it out. Basic concept about a shooter that takes off kids on the road. And it's called Downrange. Nice. And um, I think this is one of the most brilliant basic slasher or shooter up films, whatever you want to fucking call them, survival horror, that have come out. And I stand by that. Um, this film is very basic. It's about a group of kids going on a road trip. Their car breaks down. And there's a sniper taking them out one by one. And they're hiding and they're afraid. And it's fucking awesome. Uh, the acting yeah. in this is out of this world. They build tension and fear so well. You're glued to the screen. Like, you're not sure who's going to get shot next. And I think <clears throat> similar to the Belko experiment with people exploding, you don't know when that's going to happen. The same thing with this movie. You don't yeah. know when people are going to be shot. And there's some very traumatic experiences that happens with a family that's innocent that yeah. shows up on the scene. Actually, they're all innocent. Who are we kidding? They're all innocent. The shooter here is the person that's a piece of shit. But um, excellent film. Doesn't get the push that it deserves. I think a lot of people have not seen it. It is available on Shutter. Um, you can find it in the film festival awards section. I did, I believe it won a couple of awards as well. Uh, great, simple premise for a horror movie. Survival yeah, this, horror. This one was on uh, in my top 100 when I was cutting it down. And like, nice. yeah, very very tense film and yes that's pretty much how do you survive against a survivalist that is basically just hunting for fun and you're his uh you're what he is hunting and yep. he's and it's a sniper that is like so well prepared like he has everything he needs yep. in his little spot and he's hidden so well and like yeah it's just like what do you do in that situation like great movie yeah it's very intense great movie i'm glad that you liked it too child's play was also 
on my list too, but I cut it out because I love it. Don't get me wrong. But if I, what I, when I made my list, I was like, what could I watch over and over and over and over again? Yeah. And I could watch Downrange over and over again. If it wasn't for me being so dedicated to these first time watches, I would be watching these movies all the time because Same. especially Downrange, I think it's fucking phenomenal. So I'm glad to hear you also agree and praise it as well. So yeah, because you told me to watch it and yeah, I was amazing movie yeah so hopefully it's a little gem that maybe if people haven't seen they can check it out so what's your uh 48 all right so i'm going this is my more modern film so far but uh number 48 is 2016's autopsy of jane doe fucking awesome movie fuck did this movie Man, get under film. my skin like the like this is isolation horror at almost at what it, at its finest like mm-hmm, it is mm-hmm. when i watched this the first time i was like okay what the fuck is happening here like cuz you know they're basically I, I forget the the actors names but they they it's a father and son just doing an autopsy on this yep. body that got brought in yeah. and the son isn't even supposed to be there he's supposed to be yeah, he's out supposed with, to his with his girlfriend yep yeah and like i just love the whole mystery of okay we're gonna do our autopsy on this body and they just keep finding these really weird things Mm -hmm. with this body and they're going what the fuck and they and then all of a sudden like stuff starts happening like and it's just as it unravels more and more it's just like this just insane like what the fuck is going on and you want to continue watching it but at the same time after watching that movie, I have never been so chilled by just mm-hmm. hearing a bell t- jingle because they have the whole, you know, we tie bells to the uh, feet of our bodies just because it's an old superstition that if the bodies move, we can hear the bell jingling yeah. and know the bodies come to life. And the use of that just slight little sound, like just coming out of nowhere sometimes, it brought chills up my spine. And yeah, the- totally. And yeah, this film is just incredible. And the actress playing the body of Jane Doe sitting on that slab the whole film and not moving and just pretending to be dead. That was a real actress. No, just fake body. That was her. And that that's that's that took some talent just to be able to stay still and look like that the whole time. I agree. And I think also when we look at that movie, talk about atmosphere done right. Yeah. You know, like you you can build a, a, a villain. Like you start off with being like, oh, this young lady's a protagonist without her saying anything. Mm-hmm. And then she becomes the antagonist. You're unsure what happened to her. And then when you learn who she is, you're terrified of someone that doesn't even do anything. You're right. A dead like body. how incredible <laughs> is that for the other actors to react enough you know we saw that in last year's we need to do something yeah to react to the unknown is incredible and i think that's what sometimes we miss out in movies is people's ability to create fear from just the atmosphere and i think the autopsy jane doe does that perfectly yeah like this is probably one of the more terrifying films i had to sit through back in the day like and it because it's still like one of those films where when i watch it i just feel on edge the whole time even though i know what's coming i still feel on edge totally totally no i couldn't agree more excellent choice um my 48th film is one that i just watched um it's an irish folklore film (laughs) nice recommended from well (laughs) someone who i used to chat with i guess (laughs) I'll say. Um, and it's called The Hollows, 2015. Great movie. And this was recommended to me because I was interested in going to Ireland. And this person that I used to chat to or was chatting to uh, told me about the how, I guess, people who live in rural Ireland are, are very superstitious in some cases. And one of the things they fear is fairies. And I was like, oh, fairies. He's like, well, no, not those kind of fairies, Heather. Like, these are different kind of fairies. So I wanted to learn more. So he recommended this movie to me. Told me it wasn't the best movie in the world. I disagree. I thought it was actually quite good. The the sum of it is a couple relocates to rural Ireland. I think it's probably Northern Ireland. And they he's it's an arborist. He's there to cut down trees. And he is warned that there's fairies that live in the woods that will you know, attack, basically, if you try to take what's theirs. And it's a great, they do, by the way, (laughs) and they're fucking scary. And it's a a changeling story as well. And I spent a lot of that movie being like, is the father crazy? Or is he right? And there's a very emotional ending. And I really felt for this family. Uh, It made me not want to hike in the woods by myself when I go to (laughs) Ireland. Um and not run into fairies so but it's it's an excellent film and i think that 
I don't know if it's a well-known film. Like, I don't know if a lot of people have seen it, but if you like folklore, uh, it's excellent. And it's a very, very good emotional kind of roller coaster with this young family and them trying to survive in this really um, superstitious environment. And I'm a big person in the superstitions. I, I definitely have a lot of belief in superstitions. So it totally was up my alley. This movie is awesome. I, I watched it uh, yeah, the year it came out and I think it had made my top 10 that year. And nice. yeah, I, cause I, you know me, I'm all about like the folklore and like, mm-hmm. I love learning about like the mythical creatures from other countries and stuff like that and see movies with doing fairies in the way that they are actually presented in mythology yeah. instead of as like what we well, pre- the think version, they are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Like, and these are, yeah, these are scary. These are terrifying. Yeah, they are. They, and they reminded me of the creatures from the descent a bit. Absolutely. No, great, great film. I thank that person for bringing it to my attention. Um, because it's, it's one of my top films now. My, one of my top 50 for sure. Enjoy That's it so awesome. Yeah. Cause yeah. I remember when you watched that and you're like, wow, this movie's really good. You need to see this. Yeah. Book. I was like, I you see it. like, I already seen it, Heather. <laughs> Get to the program. So what's your 47, Scotty? All right. My number 47 is a film from 2015 that we actually talked about on our podcast. Ooh. Uh, and that is We Are Still Here. Oh, very nice. One of the most craziest freaking, probably one of my favorite ghost stories out there. Like, like I've talked about on the show over and over again on that, like on that episode, but like, I just love the concept of, you know, typical ghost movies. You have this chill when the ghost is around, not in this film, you feel heat. Mm -hmm. And I love the concept of that because these people were Mm -hmm. burned alive. So they are just crispy, burnt beings that are like killing in extremely violent ways. And probably one of the best performances from Larry Fessenden and Barbara Crampton. Absolutely. Like, Incredible. Those those two both did fantastic. Like when Larry Fessenden gets freaking uh, possessed, it is creepy and terrifying. And the way he's talking and everything is just intense. Barbara Crampton dealing with the loss of her son being just a mother that's, you know, grieving. Just phenomenal job. Special effects, incredible. And third act is fucking insane. Larry Fessenden is an actor that is highly underrated. Yeah. I saw him recently in Jug Face, 2013. Oh, yeah. Fuck. Every movie he's in, like, he's still, and I wonder if it's because he's a bigger dude and he's not, like, the most handsome man in the world, why he isn't recognized more. Because, you know, Hollywood is very superficial because he is a fucking phenomenal actor. Yeah, like, and, and he's been in the industry, in the horror indie industry for quite some time. And, like, yeah, he just... Because he good. He, yeah, he just, he's amazing. Like, one of my favorite yeah. actors that I've... One of my favorite modern actors, I should say. Like, if he's in a movie, he's at least worth watching. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, he he's at least very entertaining in it. And I, you know what, I, I can't say more than what you said. I think this movie has some great jump scares. I think it sets the cold atmosphere very well. Yes. And I think you feel a lot of empathy for the ghost and for Barbara Crampton's character and the grief and everything else. This film is just fucking 10 out of 10. Yeah. Like it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Cause every one of these films on my top 50 are 10 out of 10s. Yeah. We are, and yet again, these are our own personal top 10 yeah. out of 10s people. Like these are just ones that we top 10 out of 10 enjoy. Um, my 47th is not nearly as a deep film, but it is a film that came out on Shutter in 2019 and it's called Haunt. Um, nice. And I love this film unapologetically. I love this film. <laughs> uh, I love that they go to this fucking haunted house and it's set up just like when you go to these campy roadsides, fucking haunted houses and you go through and this shit happens and you feel so bad for these kids. And I'll never forget the scene where the one kid makes it outside with that guy. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Would you like to see what my face looks like? Oh, it's so creepy. It is fucking disturbing and excellent movie to watch around Halloween. Love it, love it, love it. Um, if you enjoy haunted houses and you want to watch a movie that's realistic to go into these but fuck not haunted houses with a budget, like it has a budget. It's not a cheaply fucking slap together film. Like this is a right. well-made film. Um, check out Haunt. It's still on Shutter. So sh- I think it's a Shutter exclusive, 2019. Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah, this movie is really awesome and definitely one to watch around the Halloween season when the haunts are like big and popular right at that time of year. And yeah, this one is very creepy and definitely hits that whole. You don't know what you're doing. Like you don't know what you're walking into when you go into some of these haunted attractions. Nope, not at all. Right. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, great choice. Thank you. And now I guess we're on to your 46. All right. So my number 46 is a film from 2010. 
and it is one that some people may argue if it's horror or not but well when you're dealing with the black death or plague i would call that horror and that film is called black death from 2010 uh, I've praised is, this movie many a time, Scotty. Yep, it was my, back when uh, Exploding Heads did their uh, top 100 films of the decade, this was my number one film when like they were asking listeners for well, their top 100s. I just love this film. It's a very indie film, low budget, but I love that it's set in, you know, the uh, set in the past and dealing with the plague. You have these men that are hired by the church to, uh, they, I think they were like Knight Templars, but they were hired by the church to investigate this village that somehow has not suffered any deaths from this plague. And they are thinking... Did they all get vaccines? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, they are going there and they find out that there is this woman that is like basic, like they heard that there's this woman that is basically a healer and they are assuming she is a witch that is somehow like causing the plague, but protecting her own little village. And so they go there to investigate it and well, shit goes down and it is a very tense, well acted film with some very brutal kills. I mean, I mean, there's a poor, uh, poor Sean Bean who seems to die in almost everything he's in. But uh, he gets drawn and quartered by, like, where if you don't know what that is, that's four horses are tied to each of your limbs, and then a whip is snapped, and all horses go in different directions, ripping you. Oh four. man! Ugh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very intense film, and but like very realistic with the way they handled the plague, like, and it's just a very harrowing. Story. So everyone is was in denial, and no one wanted to get vaccines. Exactly, and they said it was a <laughs> conspiracy, right? Yes. Well, how was there the plague if there was no cell towers? It's only the flu, Heather. Oh, okay. My it's bad. just the flu. <laughs> My bad. But no, this movie is incredible. And I love these period. You know me, I'm a big fan of period pieces. And this one, this one, like I, like even though it's different themes, but I think this one would uh, go well with The Witch as a double feature, just because it's in that kind of same period almost. Well, that's good to know. I still so haven't not seen in the same it. period, but yeah. I haven't seen it, but I think I will have to because you've praised it many times and I can't believe I've not watched it. So I'm going to have to get on that this year. Yeah, I can see you going, ah, God, this is definitely a Scott movie. Oh, uh, yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> I think that about a lot of things that I watch um, that you have suggested to me. Uh, 46 for me is a movie that came out in 2019 and I think summed up the fucking toilet paper shortage and food shortage and all the other shit that was happening in March of that year. And it's called The Platform. And it's a ah. Spanish masterpiece. Um, one of the most heaviest hitting films I have watched that made so much sense for the time. Uh, Scotty and I had just made it to realize that COVID was not going to last for two weeks. I think right. by the time we watched this movie and I remember talking to him and being like, wow, this is fucking relevant. Wow. Mm, yeah. um, I remember Scott probably doesn't remember this, but one night we were chatting and he went to the store to get toilet paper. And he bought the last roll that was there. And he had people given him like the evil eye in the checkout. Mm -hmm. I remember and that. And I, I remember, like, I look back on that now and I'm probably talking more about the atmosphere more than the movie. But the movie is, is fucking incredible with the concept of food being lowered down. And if everyone just took what they needed, there'd be enough. But they shit on the table. Literally, they shit on the table that's being lowered. Mm -hmm. They shit on the people beneath them. There's this hierarchy of you need to purge yourself now or you know gorge yourself now because you don't know if you will have nothing later and people starve to death and it's such a relevant interesting concept and you follow these a couple of characters there's two characters that are kind of your main characters and then there's some sidebar ones and it is a emotional fucking roller coaster and international films do it best man they know they how to hit do. you in the feels and uh, the platform was my start of loving of spanish films so platform is my number 46 so scotty what's your 45 great freaking movie because yeah man that movie is whew, that is a tough one heavy. to sit through yeah right and well i guess we're just gonna go with heavy for right now because speaking of tough to sit through uh this one we did on our very first episode of the podcast and it's from 2019 and that oh, very is very nice lords of chaos awesome oh man this is you know this was also argued as would this be a horror film because it's basically a biopic of the black metal band mayhem and yep. like what was going on with them behind the scenes and like the murder that happened with the lead singer erroneous and holy shit this is some of the most hardest to watch 
uh, kills and suicide. Yeah. Like they like it's a great, just interesting, like fascinating story. The fact that you're watching this, going, this really fucking happened. Obviously, like you know, they expanded it to make it more for a movie. Well, and sensationalized it, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. that, that's the word I was on the first. Sensationalized. Yeah. But holy shit, because yeah, this stuff did happen. And like the watching the character that his name was Death do his committed commit suicide in his room, that was whew, one of the hardest yeah. things I had to sit through. And then one of the most harrowing experiences was watching uh uh I think it was Burzum, I think it was named, but uh stabbing erroneous when at uh, at the end of the movie. Yeah. And because that was like it's one emotional. of the most brutal stabbings I have ever seen and just realistic and like, there is a lot of, like, obviously, like I said, this is just a biopic, but what they show on this film is just freaking hard to watch. Very hard to watch. It is. It is. And, right. And the performances all around are incredible. Like, this is, like, it, like I said, it feels like a horror film, but this is shit that happened in real life. And it's, which, you know, it makes it even more horror. Horrific. Yeah. Yes, it does. I think you've summed it up perfectly. That film was incredible. The acting in it showed really who the best Culkin is. Yeah, when it comes to acting, um, fucking phenomenal. The the ending scene, that drag out death scene, is probably more realistic to what it actually looks like. Yeah, and it's it's heavy, 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 but great movie. Deserves to be on the list. Yeah, deserves to be on the list for sure. Uh, my my forty fifth is the Descent two thousand and five. Um, I really enjoyed the interaction between the women in this film. I really enjoyed how they're going on a trip and I don't know, chaos happens in these caves. And there's the one scene where the one chick has to go underneath for all like, I think it's like feces and shit. And mm-hmm. she has to like hold her breath. And these creatures that sense by hearing, they can't see, but they can yeah. hear you. And it's awesome. And even the ending's fucking disturbing as shit. I didn't love the sequel as much, uh, but I no. really did enjoy the first one. I thought that it was a great survival film. I love that it was a full female cast um it was great great film I, and i you know that's why it's on my number 45 yeah the descent is an amazing movie and one thing that i will give that film credit for i mean besides already just being a great film but the tension that is built just from cave diving yes like yes. the way like the way it is shot and the way it is filmed like from the stuff like the where they are going like what the situation they're in without the monsters is extremely dangerous and yeah. just, i I could watch a movie like that without any monsters in it, and I would still be on the edge of my seat because it's just like it's intense, like what they're going through. Well, and the fact that she knows that her best friend's having an affair with her husband too, right? Yeah, like, it's, and like the drama it's, being added to it. Oh my god! Like it's just there's so many layers to that film um, for like a simple little survival film. Like it's not really a film that's supposed to be overly deep, and it and it ends up having a lot of layers to it, and layers that are done right. You know, I'm glad yeah. they didn't throw in someone fucking being pregnant randomly. Like, thank oh god, god right? <laughs> like honestly, I feel like that's a go to in every survival. I treat pregnant, right? Like every single fucking survival film. Um, but yeah, what's your forty four? Uh, my number forty four is uh, one that you'll probably be happy to hear is on the list, and that is two thousand and eight Canadian Pontypool. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, this movie, once again, a low budget film done right and taking the con- the zombie concept in a completely different direction. And I just love the fact that like these people are getting infected because of words and like yes, and the English language, which had a lot to do with. I think what people don't realize is that there's a lot of conflicts between French and English in Canada because we have two official languages. Everything in yeah. Canada is in French and is in English, and. You know, I think that was a little bit of a Canadian thing that if you're American or from another country, you didn't really get it. Why English was infected and French was not. Like, but yeah. Yeah. But like, man, intense zombie film didn't really show a lot of zombie action, but you didn't need to. Like a lot of it was just over the radio. And I love that. Like it's Mm -hmm. very simplistic and just perfectly well like perfectly done the way they did it totally i couldn't agree more i think that film and even the slow decline of the the main characters who do get sick um, yes is really really well done and the yet again building intensity without being outside you know we saw this as well and we need to do something and i think a lot of people sometimes push movies like that aside because they don't have the bells and whistles and they don't have you know, the over top special effects, but these films are able to build an atmosphere without all that. And that's real talent, you know, that's real talent from a director, writer, and actor standpoint. So, and set the sign and set the sign as well too, because you have to have a believable set where you've left kind of things at. Um, My number 44 is The Conjuring 2013. Nice. You know, I had to give respect to the original, to the beginning, 
Um, that movie scared the fuck out of me the first time I saw it. Like that's for jump scares. I felt like the jump scares there were great. And then every other conjuring movie, I just feel like I'm walking through a house at Niagara Falls. Right. But this movie, I feel like because it was the beginning of it, um, really stood with me. You felt really bad for the family, specifically the little girl that was being targeted. There's the Mm -hmm. cellar scene where she's climbing in the basement and shit, like Lorraine and stuff. And it's creepy. Like it's scary. Um, and I really appreciate the conjuring because of that and, and what it started, not so much necessarily the sequels. I'm not a huge fan of the, what is it? The Waterverse or whatever it's called. Yeah. It's it's okay. Like, don't get me wrong. It's okay. Like I like the nun. I didn't mind curse of Lorna. Like I didn't mind the conjuring. What are we at three now? Conjuring three. I enjoyed the Annabelle movies. Like they're fine. Um, but I had to give the conjuring the respect it deserves because if I just go back and think about that movie, I thought it was fucking awesome at the time. Yeah, it was very, uh, very well done. And once again, just a uh, good use of like just tension. Yeah, absolutely. And good and good jump scares. Like that's, I felt like in that one jump scares, they relied on it, but it was fresh. And now yeah. it's just like every conjuring movie is just jump scares. Oh, it like absolutely you're just going to be doing jump scares for two hours. So, which is fine, you know, if that's what you like, but I, I think the first one did it best. So yep. let's move on to 43. All right. So my number 43, we are going back to 1995. Oh, man. And, uh, one, uh, definitely one of the uh, well-known anthologies and one of my probably, I think, top three, top four anthologies of all time. And that is Tales from the Hood. That was on one of my, that was on my list and I just took it off the last minute. So that's Oh, awesome. really? Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Man, this film is just like, you know, watching it as a like horror film, it is just heavy and dark and has just some great stories. Then you put in the racial context that is in this film, that is per- why they made this film and how relevant it is to this day is just very uncomfortable. Like, they sprinkle in comedy here and there, but it's not enough to just like ease ease what you are watching. Well, especially it's so the real. brutality, right? Because it's still very relevant today. Like yeah. nothing's really changed. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great fucking anthology. Awesome. Like every story in it is fucking solid, and the wraparound is very awesome. Amazing. Like, yeah. Clarence Williams the third playing the uh, caretaker. It, it's just ugh, so. You could tell he's having fun with that role and he's just dark and creepy at the same time. Amazing. And yeah, like when you look at the cover of this, you're going, oh, this is just going to be so generic and cheesy because it's just a skull with a gold tooth and sunglasses. And you're like, oh, God, this is going to be so cheesy. Then you watch and you're going, damn, okay, no, this is not cheesy. It's heavy. Like, it's very it's heavy. heavy. Yeah. And I watched this when it first came out. And, you know, obviously, like the subtext just right over my head because I was really oh, yeah. young. Yeah. But watching it as I got older, I'm just like, fuck <laughs> yeah as a grown-up scotty it hits a little different doesn't it, it? definitely does yeah. yeah no i couldn't agree i was really glad when i watched it. i remember i thought it was gonna be a light watch <laughs> yeah no, 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 no. <laughs> not a light watch <laughs> not at um, all so it's funny because my 43 is also an anthology but it's from 1972 and it's tales from the crypt nice um it's it's definitely the story about the man that dies and the woman doing the wishes with the monkey paw and her mm-hmm. final wish. If you've listened to our top five anthologies, you know how much I love that story. Um, fucking nails it for me. Like that story alone nails it because the thought of what you wish for and what happens and that coming true to someone who you care about is fucking devastating. Like I can't think of a scarier ending to something that that person has to fully forever live in pain and there's no yeah. escape, like no escape from it. How like, I, I, yeah, I, it still leaves me speechless. Um, <laughs> anyway, well, so. And that once again, that's an anthology that has amazing stories all around. Mm-hmm. Like you have the Santa Claus story that you know, got redone in the nine, late nine or early nineties with the Tales from the Crypt series. Yep. And there's the, uh, what was it? The, I, I think there was four stories. I can't remember the second one off the top of my head. But then, yeah, the third one was the one you were talking about with the monkey yep. paw. And then the fourth one was the a caretaker gets hired to take care of the blind. And he's just oh, torturing he's them and cutting yeah. costs left and right. And they get revenge. And, oh, my God, it's amazing. Well, and all the people are in purgatory, right? And they're yeah. having to learn about what their past sins were before they go to hell. 
um, it's really interesting. It's a really fascinating concept and especially for 1972. So um, glad I watched it this year. It was a first time or last year, first time watch for me in 2021. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah. yeah, what's your 42nd, Scotty? All right. So my number 42 is 1988. Actually, the first remake on my list, 1988's The Blob. I was thinking you were going to say that when you said my first remake. Yeah, this movie is just awesome. I mean, it's totally 80s, but the special effects cannot be denied here. The way they created this monster, and it just looks so fucking good. And the kills in it are all done practically and just look amazing. And this is one of those films where you don't know who is safe in this film because they even, this creature even has killed off kids that were like part of the main story for a Mm -hmm. bit. Like, Mm -hmm. and I mean, it's directed by Frank Darabont and, you know, he's a great director and maybe we'll be talking about him again down the road, but uh, he's just, uh, he, he nailed this movie. It's freaking awesome. Uh, I love the special effects in it like so much. And like, I was once again, the uh, I was scared to look down a drain like of a sink for the longest time after seeing this movie. And <laughs> I'm then, still scared because you never know what's down that drain. Well, I was gonna say, and then Stephen King's It came out in 1990 and it reinforced the whole being scared of looking down a drain of yeah, a sink. Yeah, you can't even walk past <laughs> sewers. You're just right? completely scared of everything. I know, excellent remake. Ex- especially like you're right, that scene where she's in the kitchen and or he's in the kitchen. It's yep, a guy that kitchen. gets it right. Yeah, she walks in and sees it um fuck that's a great scene great special effects for 1988 still entertaining to watch today yeah um absolutely my film is also a 1988 film it's part of a franchise i didn't have the same role scott did i used there was a couple of franchises that did get mentioned multiple times um and this one is friday the 13th part seven and i unapologetically love fucking part seven so everyone can bite me if you don't like this movie um i love what's her face in it the chick that's like carrie but not carrie yeah that fucking shit is that shit is mint okay like her mind game she it's like real mind games that people play i feel like i've had that played with me recently and i'm jason (laughs) and i'm not mad about it i'm getting real fucking pissed about the mind games uh i digress so this is great like the part where the part i'm thinking of is when she does something to him i forget what it is i think she burns him or something and like he gets really mad he's like i'm gonna fuck this bitch up you know what part i'm talking about right yes and he like comes after kane harder is great like he's awesome in this role and i love how she's the first one to really take him on and inflict real damage in him and stand up to him because everyone else up to this point has run away. Yeah. And their concept, like, I guess in the end of part six, you know, uh, Tommy, you know, paddles out to the middle of the lake and has that big fight with Jason in the boat. But it's it's not the same as for the females. Like, this was the first female that's like, I don't fuck with you. <laughs> right? And I, I fucking love it. I can watch it. And then when her dad comes up from the dock at the end and grabs him and like, I love that shit. Fucking love that movie. I love part seven. And, and, you know, you wouldn't think that by the time you got to part seven in the movie, it would be fun. And I think either people love this movie or they hate this movie. And I love it. I think the telekinesis idea was fucking brilliant. And I thought it made it for a real entertaining watch. Yeah, this movie is a lot of fun. Like I was, I'm shocked to hear it on your top fifty because I yeah. didn't realize you liked. You it didn't that probably much. know I realized that mu- I liked it that much. Did yeah, you? no, not yeah. at all. Like I, I knew you probably liked it, but I didn't think that much. But yeah, yeah I love the awesome. chick. I want that, that to is, be me. But yeah, that is awesome because it is by far the best looking Jason, especially yes. without the mask as well. John Carl Buechler's effects in that are incredible because the detail that they went into and in showing all of the damage that Jason has been dealt throughout all the movies up to this point and showing it on his character like that it was freaking awesome and like i would love to see the unrated cut but there we unfortunately will never will because they, they, it got cut and then i think the uncut footage got destroyed somehow but there's supposed to be a lot more violence and gore and practical effects but still this movie is a lot of fun like definitely one of my one of my favorites in the franchise. Like or her I, name's Tina, by the way, right? The final girl, Tina. That's yeah. what it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But. I I sat here staring at you as you were talking, going, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> Tina. And it was so fucking good. And that chick that plays the real bitch was awesome. The girl yeah. that's like fucking horrible. She was a great little actress, actually. There were some not bad teen actors in that movie um and you really do like hate the doctor and shit like it's just it's a really good film it's it's 
I don't know. It's a really good Friday the 13th film. I, uh, I think we should all give it a shot. All right, Scotty, yeah, what's, your, what's your 41? My number 41? Well, I will start off by just saying, I got good news and bad news, girls. Your dates are here. Bad news is they're dead. That <laughs> is Night of the Creeps, 1986. Yeah. Oh, this movie is just so much fun. Um, it's a, you know, silly sci-fi, like sci-fi B-movie style concept with these parasitic worms that like turn people into zombies by latch jumping into their mouths and controlling them. And, but it's just, I feel done. like men do that to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good Lord. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. One of my favorite <laughs> roles by Tom Atkins, just he's uh, Tom Atkins and as charismatic as and awesome and everything. Um, but it's got just a great cast of characters and plays out like your typical like college comedy style movie. And then add in the like B movie style, like horror stuff that's going on. This movie is just so much fun and can just be, I can just watch this over and over and over again. It is just a blast from beginning to end. Yeah. It's a fun film. It's, and Tom Atkins, man, like, you know what I mean? You can't go wrong when Tom Atkins in a movie. He's great. Yeah. He, everything he does. He's amazing. Right. Well, I'm going to choose something that isn't nearly as well done, uh, but I loved it. I remember I worked at a uh, summer job and I used to work in the resource room and I used to have to work late some nights and it was for like a career center and I would go on IMDb or whatever the website was at the time to look at movies that were coming out. And I waited a year for this movie to come out and I counted down the months and that was fucking Freddy vs. Jason. And it nice. is my number 41 from 2003. Fuck and yeah. I was so, this movie, it would have mattered how stupid it was, all right? It would have mattered what fucking plot they threw. I didn't give a fuck what the plot looked like. I didn't give a fuck what actors they got in it. I just wanted to see Freddie and Jason fight. Isn't that what we all wanted to see? It's oh, Freddie and Jason fight. And they, That's all we wanted to see. And they um, delivered. And they delivered. There was some great fucking fight scenes. One of my favorite is when uh, he goes into Jason's dream and they're fighting in the dream. And then the water comes and Jason turns into a child. Oh, yeah. And you feel bad for Jason. They actually made Jason kind of like this anti-protagonist that you kind of were like, well, they're both assholes, but now I want Jason to win because Freddie's being a real bully. And I thought that was really clever. Um, I I love the, the scene in the junkyard where they're fighting. Um, I think it's fucking phenomenal. I don't know. Like, it's cheesy as shit, okay? The Freddy versus Jason is not a good movie. I will never sit back and be like, oh, man, one of the best all-time fucking horror films. But I love the fighting between the two of them. I love yeah. it. I could watch it over and over and over again to watch them fight. And I love those fight scenes. And that's what I went there for. That's what I waited in line to see. That's what I waited a year for. And I was very satisfied. Um, I was very happy with the outcome. Freddy walking with or uh, Jason walking with Freddy's head and he winks at the audience just tells you that these are two franchise leaders. Like people like like to argue who won. What a dumb fucking argument. Right. Why would you argue that? They're yeah. both internal. Both yeah. won. Yeah, you know they who both lost? Win. Humans. <laughs> yeah. Because they're gonna keep dying. <laughs> Like, honestly, I, I never, ever got that debate of who won when it's so clearly that they're both franchise legends and eternal evil that neither one of them are going to fucking die. Yeah. Like, I don't mean, like, we always joke, Scott and I, like, you know, when we came up with Friday Nightmares, mine was the Freddy piece of it. His was the Friday piece of it. But, like, Scott and I don't learn, like, oh, my God, the Nightmare on Elm Street films and the Friday 13th films are the best films in the entire world. Like, you will never hear Scott and I do that. We enjoy those series, but we enjoy both of the series. We just chose that because one of us seemed to be a little more into Freddy and one of us seemed to be a little bit more into Jason. And that's yeah. why we came up with that fucking name. Like, it wasn't anything. Like, and we wanted something that was different. Um, so I guess Freddy versus Jason is really Scott versus Heather. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And that's why it's number uh, 41 on my list. So yeah, Scotty. I, I have to say, I've seen this movie three times in theater. So yeah, I love this movie. Right. It's, it's not the greatest of any of either of the franchises, but it is a not. dumb popcorn film. They somehow figured out a way to actually bring these icons together and the only complaint I will ever have with that film or that, yeah, that film 
is that I wish Freddy would have been able to kill more than just one person. Like, because he only kills the uh, the uh, blonde-haired Des- kid. Des- no, the Destiny's Child chick. He kills her. Nope, no, he- Jason kills yeah, her. Yeah, Jay- you're right. Jason kills her. Yeah, because he had Jason yeah. kill her. But like, yeah. no, every, like Jason, like I do love the idea that, you know, Jason stole his first kill, which was going to help cause more fear in the world to like bring him back. And he got pissed. So he went after Jason for that. I love that concept because... Like he said, like uh, like he did, like he said as uh, Jason's mother in that, you're just like a big dumb, dumb dog, dog that doesn't know how to stop eating. <laughs> it's really funny, and Jason's like, like those lines are great, and Robert England delivering delivering them as fucking men, you know, yeah. like he just anyway. Not that I think he's the only one that could be Freddy Krueger. We've had this dance before, um, but it's just such a fucking fun film. Like it really is, and yeah. it's not meant to be taken seriously. Like they threw together a fucking plot to watch two people fight. Like yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's a, it's just a fun film. Like nothing. I, I don't find it like offensive at all. No. Well, there's one line in it that you kind of are like, Kelly, yeah. Rowling, did you really need to say that? But you know what? It was 2003, and I can, I said a lot of stupid shit in 2003 too. Right. I'm just lucky it's not on film. I'll <laughs> right. Put it, I'll put it like that. So, yeah. we live and learn, right? We live and learn. All right. So I guess we are moving on to number 40. So, number 40 for me, we're going back to the 90s again, 1992's Candyman. Oh, smoke show, smoke show, (laughs) smoke show. And Scott shows up and tells you to watch Gremlins. (laughs) Watch it, watch it, it's amazing. (laughs) Uh, But, I mean, this movie, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. There is a reason why this was a, it was relevant back then and is still relevant now with the story. And I love the, the concept of this urban myth, uh, mythology that uh, you have this like student going to, to like just kind of learn about it and going to one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago, especially at that time. Mm-hmm. And like the setting alone is like a character of the story. Like agreed. Cabrini Green is just like it just is dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. And you can I see agree. that just by walking around, like just by what they've shown in the film. And like it's like uh, I just love everything about this. Tony Todd is incredible and like just creepy as uh Candyman himself. Like it's just he his performance in this is amazing. Granted, like uh God, I am doing terrible with actors and actresses' names today, but like the woman that plays Helen, like she did good, but like I wouldn't say like amazing but Mm -hmm. like but i do love that basically like candy man is seducing her and just kind of like manipulating her kind of like i was talking about with chucky earlier manipulating them totally but man this story just i've watched it a few times when it first came out and then i watched it a lot because i covered it on different podcasts as guest spots and stuff throughout the last couple of years and man i just love this film more and more i want the more and more i watch it the scene with the baby at the end and (sighs) man is it emotional right yeah and it was a great tie-in, by the way, to 2021's. Yes. I enjoyed that throwback, and I don't care what anyone says. No, 2021 was also an amazing uh, movie. and a But how great they way... connected the baby. Yeah. Right? I think yeah. that was really smart. Well, how they connected everything from those two yeah. movies. And it was amazing. Yeah, great, se- great sequel to the original. Absolutely. But yeah, but yeah this movie, incredible. Like, it's... Tony Todd is an icon now for a reason because of this film. You mean it's not from Final Destination? Or <laughs> Urban? I mean, it might be partly now. I mean, he's been in that, been, he played that character more than he played Candyman. <laughs> right. Um, I agree, Scotty. My number 40 is uh, also from the 90s. It is 1994. And it is the Wes Craven movie that saved the Nightmare on Elm Street nice. franchise. And that is the new nightmare. Um, I think the new nightmare was fucking brilliant. And I will stand by that for as long as I live. Um, he broke down, what do you say, the fourth wall? Yeah. Right. And it was like the a, first the meta third, movie. Not the third wall. That's what I have. Yeah. I have a third <laughs> wall and then I have a fourth wall. They broke down the fourth wall. And it was that part where the little kid is in the, is in the hospital and his babysitter gets fucking killed is graphic as fuck. And yeah. I loved how... Heather Lanning Camp played herself. Robert Anglin played himself. Wes Craven played himself. Like, love that movie. Now, it is a little long. Sometimes when you do watch it, it kind of drags out at parts a little mm. bit. But the ending scene of the showdown between this, like, complete fucking really fucked up demon version of Freddy Krueger. Like, he was bad. But this yeah. version of Freddy is even fucking darker. And it's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. It was a brilliant concept at the time and one of my favorite films. Yep. And some would say laid the groundwork for Scream. 
Yes, and for sure. Like, but like, yeah, this is a very good. Like, this was a good way to breathe life back into this franchise instead of making. Yep. Instead of making Freddy Krueger the comedian that he became, like it yeah. took him back to being terrifying again. Absolutely right. So yeah, New Nightmare, nineteen ninety four. All right. So what is your number thirty nine? Uh, my number 39, uh, I've talked about this on our show a couple different times as well. In fact, talked about it in our top five with uh, uh, 1970s films with Mr. Android Virus. And that is Let Sleeping Corpses Lie from 1974 or Living Dead at the Manchester Morgue. Yeah, and plenty of other titles. But this is just an all-around amazing zombie film with a unique concept about how this uh, machine that produces radiation to wipe out like insects and pests somehow ends up waking the dead. And these zombies are extremely creepy. Uh, they're the old school slow moving zombies, but they are brutal in what they do. And it is just an incredible zombie film. Like I said, I've talked about it a bunch of different times. We've even had it on, like it was one of the films in our zombie episode that we've discussed way back in the day. So I won't get into too much detail because yeah. I've talked about it enough, but yeah, 1974's Let's Sleeping Corpses Lie. Awesome, awesome. Well, mine will definitely be near and dear to your heart and may come up on your list later. It is The Fog, 1980. Ooh, um, not on my I, list. I love this film. I think uh, I love Tom Atkinson and Jamie Lee Curtis. And is it Adrian Barbeau? Yep. Uh, fuck, they're so great in this movie. And I love the creepy ghost story behind it of this town and how Jamie Lee Curtis kind of just like shows up and all this shit's going down. <laughs> and she's like, what the fuck? Right? Like, it's, it's, it's so good. It's like what a classic 1980s ghost story should be mm-hmm. and what you can do with very little special effects. Now, this is one where I would say the special effects probably don't hold up as well nowadays. Um, you can like, the, the ghosts are a little cheesy, but I think that for 1980, they were awesome. And I think as a um, time capsule from 1980, this is a great fucking movie. So that is my number. I'm in number 39. Nice. Uh, That is, it's a really good movie. It it would be in my top 100. It did not make my top 50. Um, But man, this movie is great. I do love that the whole pirate ghosts, like leprous pirate ghosts. (laughs) Like that scene in the church where the like lead of the the head of the ghost kind of walks in and confronts the priest and you just see the glowing red eyes and just like the intense showdown where it grabs a hold of the cross and the cross starts burning. Such Do you think awesome the ghosts scene. were upset because they got ghosted? Because mm. I feel like that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <these days. laughs> oh, that's great. Anyway, um... <laughs> What was your number 38? Well, my number 38, I have a feeling maybe on your list somewhere. We'll find out. But uh, that is 2017's Jordan Peele directed Get Out. Oh, I'm not on my list. What? I know. I wow. know. Would be in my top 100, though. I. Because uh, the rewatchability for that one for me is not as high. Because I feel like once you know the twist, I feel that with a lot of Jordan Peele movies. Once you know the twist, it makes it like an incredible one time watch, but it's hard to rewatch it with the same. Unless you're like looking for like, oh, where are the signs? But like, I'm sorry, and get out. They're pretty fucking clear. <laughs> they are, but. Like the uh, that's the difference for me is every time I've rewatched this, I've liked it more and more and more. For sure. Um, but yeah, just an incredibly well done film. Amazing first time uh, horror film from Jordan Peele. No wonder he is uh, as well known in our genre as he is now. Like this covers racism in such a great way. It does. Like, and the characters in it are all just amazing at what they do. The mm-hmm, performances mm-hmm. are just great. Like it's funny. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And I love that they they kind of brought back the old like 1950s style evil scientist with what yeah. is happening at the end. Like I like you don't get those types of films very often anymore, but there had been kind of like a small resurgence around that time. And like, but yeah, this film just incredible all the way around. I love the music in it. I love everything about it. Like this is my favorite Jordan Peele film. That's awesome. I'm glad you brought it to the table. It is fucking phenomenal. Jordan Peele. Can't wait for Nope this year. Yes. I'm um, so excited to see what that is. See what that is, right? Um, my ni- my 38 film is a 1988 film. You brought it up briefly earlier when we talked about one of the characters. 
um, waxwork. Nice. I thought that it was a really, really brilliant film that you would go to this wax museum, which Scott and I did go to a wax museum. We did. Um, we didn't get sucked in as far as unfortunately, unfortunately, to any of the scenarios. Um, and I just thought it was really clever how these people got sucked into different um, areas and how there wasn't a happy ending. Some of them died. Yeah. And they didn't come back. Like, I, I was like, fuck, like at the end, I thought they were all going to show back up again and they didn't. And that was really shocking to me. It's like a sci-fi adventure horror flick. And I don't want to give too much away. I, I think most people have seen Waxwork, but if for some reason you've skipped it, this is a really fun one from the 80s that I really recommend that you uh, that you check out. Yeah, this, like... I know you don't agree with me on this one because I think when I when when you told me you watched it, I said this, but it, it kind of reminds me of an anthology just because like when yeah. they get sucked when they get sucked into different dioramas, it's basically like well, it's another stories. short stories. Yeah, yeah right. And, um, I, and I do love the uh, I love that David Warner is the uh, the owner of the Waxworks and mm-hmm. like he's creepy, but I and I yeah I just love I've always loved this film. I've watched it when I was younger. It has a really cool werewolf in it. it. Has like a really creepy zombie story in it. Like. I mean, it has Zach Galligan from freaking Gremlins. I mean, how can I not love it? Um, but yeah, just another in the third act when all the wax sculptures come to life and they're having to fight them off and everything. Fucking great. And the Marky Desaad thing in it yeah. is really sexual. Ooh. Yeah. I was not prepared for that where that went. <laughs> I'll be honest. I was really shocked when they had that in there. I'm like, this is not a kid's movie. This no. is definitely no. not a kid's movie. Um so yeah, so that was my number 38. So what is your 37, Scott? All right, my number 37. Uh, I will just start off by saying, boy, (laughs) that is Phantasm from 1979. Once again, another one we talked about in the top five 1970s horror films. Uh, I just love the concept of this very weird alien-like being that is coming here to collect bodies, to turn them into his little minions that he can use as basically slaves in his other dimension. Uh, Angus Scrim just so tall and creepy and intimidating as this like freaking mortician that's like not from yep. this world. And yep. it's such a weird movie, but man, does this it works on so many levels for me. Like and I couldn't agree more, yeah. Reggie Bannister is such a great character that you're just constantly rooting for through the entire franchise. Like, but yeah, this movie is just very creepy, weird, and unsettling. And it's definitely not the best performances around, but man, this movie is just so much fun. I love it. You play a good game, boy. But now you die. Yeah, and then the, um, the whole freaking the flying sentinel spheres. Those things are just, it's such a weird weapon. <laughs> awesome. It's awesome funness. I love it. I'm so glad you brought that to the table. It's up there in my top 100. Nice. Um, awesome film. Uh, mine I, I stayed a little bit more modern with, and uh, it's a film with Barbara Crampton as well. Actually, I believe this was her first film back. And she credits these directors with giving her her break back into horror movies and it's your next 2011 fucking awesome survival film and the chick in this movie is an underrated final girl yeah she is resourceful she is intelligent she's kind and when she finds out the twist with her partner she's fucking pissed um and it's a really really good film it really explores family dynamic um the kills in it are out of this world good you feel for the people doing the killing because you realize that they're family as well and it's just family versus family and it's fucked up like it really really is fucked up um great film if you haven't watched it your next 2011 check it out yeah great great home invasion great just violent horror film like and yeah awesome return of barbara crampton awesome awesome and she's given those guys credit actually yeah yeah because yeah this was the film that brought her back right so i think that that's really awesome that she was able to come back because honestly i know people love her when she was younger but when she was younger it was just about her body like let's be real talk here yeah you know and i think now that she's a more mature woman she's still a very beautiful woman women don't get less beautiful as they age despite what society may tell us right um but i think what has happened is she's been able to flex her acting chops a little bit more yeah and now she's being recognized for the talents that she actually has yeah and i think that's nice that she's being seen more than a nice pair of tits like let's be not to be vulgar here but like let's be real you know that's what she was seen as but now 
you know, she's being seen as someone who can fucking carry her own. Jacob's wife, you're next. We're still here. Um, she's nailing a lot of these roles. And she's oh, definitely she absolutely watching, is. Right? So. All right. So we're on number, what, 36? We sure are. Wow. All right. So my number 36 is, from, uh, is a camp slasher film from 1983. And that is Sleepaway Camp. Nice, nice. Um, That's awesome. This movie, while you know, does not stand the test of time with like what it reveals at the end with the transphobia and all that, yeah. but at the same time, this is still a good slasher and kind of a uh, good discussion can be had from like you know, uh, nature versus nurture and yep. like, the raising of Angela to becoming who she is by that by her crazy aunt. And totally. but like the kills are so fun and eighties, the, uh, like the characters that get killed in this all are despicable and deserve it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, at, at the time it was like that reveal at the end was completely shocking because you didn't expect it. And, yeah. and also it was kind of a good whodunit style slasher. Cause Absolutely. Like if, if you didn't know what was going on, you thought it was Ricky the whole time for the long, for like the longest part Absolutely of that movie. You did. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, this is just a great slasher, especially for its time and did something that, you know, no other film did at that time. I agree hundred percent with you. I remember talking about this ending in Dairy Queen with my girlfriend. Yeah. I remember you telling uh, this story to And me. people were staring at me and she was embarrassed. I was like, whatever. And it was a great film. And also let's just shout out Felicia Rose because one of the nicest, what I understand is constantly kind to all of her fans Yes. Uh, when I went to the convention in Niagara Falls, she was the only person with a lineup. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Um, and I think that speaks to who she is as an individual and not the best actress out there. Like, but bless her heart, she made these mo this movie and she's fucking ran with it. Yeah. And she's made money off of it and good for her. Good oh, for absolutely. Her. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, and I, I've seen some of the India stuff she's been in. It's okay. Um, you know, it is what it is, but I right. think her as a person is much more impressive and yeah. you know i really want to give a shout out to that and i think this movie uh definitely was one of the better camp slashers that came out oh for um, sure my number 36 is a movie that when i saw I, I i really dig original concepts i really like movies that break a mold and do something different and when this movie came out i really thought it was doing something different and it's called the strangers from 2008 nice and i remember watching this film and thinking what would i do if that was me and i don't know what i would have done yeah because they set it up that there's no cell service she loses her cell phone they take her cell phone and these people are just stalking this guy and this girl. Like they were going to get engaged. She said, no, they're having this awkward time at the house. Like it is their friend gets killed who comes to check on them. They kill him accidentally. Mm -hmm. Like it is a fucking, and then she wakes up at the end screaming. It is a emotional fucking film. And I even like the, the sequel strangers play at night, by the way, yeah. too, that probably would have been on my top 100. Cause I think that's a great fucking slasher. Yeah, like, you is. feel for the mom and the family and the brother and the sister. And like, it's both of those are great films, but I think when the strangers came out, it was unique to me. Um, and it showed that Liv Tyler could act to be honest yeah. with you. I didn't think she was that great of a fucking actress until that film. Um, and her and her boyfriend or fiance, you just fucking feel for throughout this entire film and the creepiness of like the characters just appearing behind you in, yeah, the, dark. in the background. Yeah. Like, oh man, fucking to me that when that came out in 2008, I was like, finally something fucking different, something entertaining. And I like that. I like when, when movies take risks and they do something different. Um, and yeah, so that's why that's at my number 36. Great freaking movie. Yeah. This would be in my top 100 for sure. Probably same with the sequel. Like, but yeah, like you were saying, like, it's one of those where it's that subtle, like, if you blink and you miss it, but they're, you know, and they'll be in the background for a split second, just watching, and then they're gone. Yeah, and an atmosphere. Just, yeah. That's why this movie has rewatchability for me, because yeah. you may miss something other times, and then you go back and you rewatch it. Um, but what's your number 35, Scott? My number 35, <laughs> we are going to 1980 and heavy, uh, talking about a film that, well, I know you find this man attractive and, uh, it is a very deep character study and that film is Maniac. Oh, my boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> this film is for one, very heavy. Like it's very uncomfortable. You are pretty much watching a man that is pretty much completely out of control lost his like he's completely off his rocker but you see like the semblance of him trying to have a normal life 
like are mm-hmm. trying to be somewhat normal and he just can't do it because his urges are too strong and there's the whole uh backstory about how he was basically abused by his mother and so like and that's why he's kind of fucked up like he is mm-hmm. but like but this film is just grimy it's gross joe spinell like amazing fucking actor and like he plays uh frank zito like so fucking well like you're just like i would not want to meet this guy like in a dark alley like he's terrifying mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and he but at the same time he's just a normal dude like you feel sorry for him yeah i think this is yet another again an example of a film where you feel sorry for the antagonist like you feel bad for him um doesn't excuse what he does of course but no. you do have a net level of empathy for him for sure yeah, and I think that's just the level of acting from Joe Spinell like, that just makes that. And this movie, like, it captures that gritty, grimy New York setting, like, that was back in the 80s, and it's done so fucking well. Like, but yeah, this movie, when I watched it for the first time, probably, like, 15 years ago, I was just like, whoa, this is really heavy. <laughs> and right. I've watched it more and more. Like, every time I've watched it, I like it more and more and more. And it's one of those films that sticks with me. It absolutely does, right? I'm glad that you brought it to the table. Maniac is a fucking phenomenal film. Um, it, it could get brought up again. You never know. Right. Um, so I would say that my number 35 is not nearly as a well-acted film, but to me, it really does sum up the 1990s. And Scott constantly quotes one of these, this film when I say, tell people to sign up for Legion Patreon. Oh. <laughs> Um, and that is, I know what you did last summer, 1997. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? <laughs> so, um, this is just a great teenage drama. You know, it, it had the hottest stars at the time. Like we're talking hot, hot, hot TV stars they put into this and, and movie stars. And they put these four characters, two of them are married now and still married. Yeah. Freddie and Sarah, um, still married. So that's awesome. Uh, and they, you know, had this unfortunate car accident where they hit somebody and they try to cover it up and it comes to haunt them a year later. And it is just so good. It is such a well done, entertaining fucking film. Do I think it's the best film in the entire world? No, I'm sure when people who are big 80s horror fans, like if I was my age now going back to watch this film, I'd be like, what the fuck is this shit? But because it came out when I was like, you know, 14 years old, I was like, this shit is the bomb. (laughs) So I have a nostalgia for it. And I think that just sums up, you know, even movies that we see today where people are like, um, that movie that dumb. It's, it's all that teenage drinks and stuff. Well, yeah, like, so as I know what you did last fucking summer, right? To break it to you. And so with Urban Legends, you know, it was just entertaining shit that you watched, yeah. right? And you are having a nostalgia for that. Guess what? This is, you know, there's someone in your house is that for somebody else for now that came out on Netflix last year. So yeah. Um. anyway, that's my number 35 is I know what you did last summer. That's great. Like I've watched that movie so much when I growing right? up as a teen. <laughs> Right. And it's such a like easy movie to watch and see. So oh, it what definitely is your, is. right? What is your number 34, Scotty? My number 34 is a film from 2015. And uh it's one that I watched a couple different times and took a bit to get into, but then by the second viewing, I was like, okay, I really like this movie. And then the third viewing, we did it for our podcast, and I was going, I fucking love this movie. And that is 2015's The Invitation fuck yeah great fucking film man talk about another film with like tense drama like from everybody meeting up in the awkward the awkward situation of you know an ex-husband an ex-wife coming back to get going to an ex-wife's house party after losing their son a couple years later but in him bringing his new girlfriend and the situation she's put into and just like the whole, well, where did my, where was my ex-wife? Why was she gone for so long? And then you find out like, oh yeah, she did this and she was on a retreat and you find out that it's about a cult. That's, oh yeah. And it's a, and it's basically a story about like, you know, what some people will do to help get past grieving by finding solace in a community. Unfortunately, this community is quite fucked up. <laughs> Yes, it um, is. And man, when things start unraveling towards that third act, it is just jaw dropping what happens. And then that final scene with the red lights turning on throughout, you see the red lights turning on all over the fucking mountainside. And it's just like, oh, fuck, this isn't just happening here. This is happening all over. 
Yeah. And man, what a just well done, well directed, well acted fucking movie. The story is incredible, and like the character development and the character arcs and the relationships between everybody is just so well done. Couldn't agree more. Excellent fucking film. Excellent yeah. film. Uh, shouts out to Brandon Orlick. Uh, one of his favorite movies of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the one that got me to watch it, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so he's really, really well acted film. Uh, mine is not a really well acted film. Um, <laughs> We're seeing the pattern here. It's also from 1997, and it was the first horror movie I ever owned, and it is Scream 2. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I owned it on VHS, and um, loved it. I loved Nev Campbell's haircut in it quite a bit and her leather jacket that she rocked throughout the entire. I actually like used to try to be that look, especially now as like an adult. Like that's the <laughs> look I want to emphasize. Um, I I loved this movie. I I loved the relationship between her and her boyfriend. I loved the killer concept in this movie. I enjoyed how it was set on a university campus. I I really thought. You know, Nev Campbell can act. She's been in stage plays in London. Yeah. You know, Chick has acting chops. So I don't think anyone should watch Scream and put that as her capabilities. um, Because she does play a pretty basic character. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Uh, But it's a very, you know, formulatic film. And there's some funny lines in it. My favorite is when Randy gets asked, what's your favorite scary movie? And he goes, Showgirls. (laughs) <laughs> like, I think that's really fucking funny. Yeah. And, like, I think if you've seen Showgirls, you know what he, I'm not a stripper. I'm a dancer. I think you know exactly what he's talking about. And this movie just kind of stuck with me. Um, I enjoyed the reveal at the end. And I I really think, you know, that opening scene with Jaded Pinkett in the movie theater with Omar Epps is fucking awesome. And I, I just don't know. I think, I think this is where kind of Scream peaked for me. Honestly, if there had just been one and two, I would have been fine with that. Um, as much as I enjoy three and four, and I do enjoy three and four, I think one and two is definitely like the golden child, except for five, which Scotty has praised and we should all run out and see right now. Um, Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Um, so yeah, Scream 2 is my, uh, is my number 34. Nice. Definitely. Uh, I, I am a fan of part two. Um. I do enjoy the characters in that, and uh, God dang it, once again, I'm drawing a blank on actors. T- Timothy Oliphant as yeah. one of the killers. I fucking love him as that character. Right, excellent. Um, but yeah, that is a good one. And I, I had a feeling uh, I would at least hear that one on your list somewhere. Right, yeah, for sure. All right, <clears throat> so 2015, again, for number 33. <clears throat> Gotta get ready for this. All right. Death Puzzle! <laughs> so yes my number 33 is death gasm so and, we've seen it oh my god you need to watch this movie i it know is, it is so ridiculous and amazing it is basically evil dead with heavy metal like with heavy heavy metal and that it's new zealand style too so it reminds me also of like has a bit of dead alive style humor from peter jackson in it as well and but man, this is just a great, fun film. Like a bunch of like a uh, loner metalhead dude like ends up meeting up with uh this other metalhead dude that decide to form a band with two dorks that play D and D. I can relate. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and they create a band called Deathgasm, and they end up one of their uh, favorite bands. Uh, one of, they find out one of the musicians is like I think the lead singer is living in their hometown, so they go and find his house but he like he's not there or they think he's not there so they break into the house and like are just kind of looking around and they find uh an old record so they pick up the record and there is this uh musical sheet in the in there and they're going oh some like song that uh they maybe wrote but they never did this band never did we're, we're gonna take it and play the song and they play the song and it ends up pretty much awakening i think it was called the blind one but uh awakening this demon that starts possessing everybody in their town and turning them into these demonic monsters. And it is so gory and over the top and hilarious. Um, like this is where I like it reminds me of Evil Dead Dead Alive, because it has like nice. the slapsticky style humor mixed with the over the top gore. And if you ever want to see two dudes beating the shit out of demons with giant double-headed dildos and anal beads as nunchucks. This will be the movie for you. This sounds like my movie. <laughs> I can see why you think I should watch it. And it's just got a great soundtrack and it's just so much fun. And 
is such a fucking blast. Like, I can't recommend this movie enough. And yeah, I am excited for the day that you decide to watch this. And I want to hear your thoughts because you're going to be like, yeah, this is a Scott movie. (laughs) I already know it's a Scott movie. The moment you said two nerds playing D&D and dildos, I was like, this is totally Scott's. (laughs) And dildos, yes. (laughs) This is totally Scott's movie right here. Um, My number 33 is not as funny. Uh, It's actually pretty dark. It's called Oculus from 2013. Oh, And I think Oculus, when I first saw that Oculus was coming out, it, it was partly funded through WWE Studios. And if we've seen the gems that come out of WWE oh, Studios, man. probably See No Evil is probably their other, like, and I'm going to put this in quotations, decent film. Right. right? <laughs> um, really strong quotations there. Um, that being said, I was like, fuck, who helped make this movie? And then I realized it was a Flanagan film. And I'm like, oh, maybe this is why it wasn't a piece of shit. Um, because it's a great story about a haunted mirror that basically tricks you into doing things or seeing things that aren't really there. There's a couple of classic scenes in this movie. There's a scene where she bites into an apple and then it looks down and sees that it's a bunch of glass, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, There's the classic scene at the the end with the brother and what happens to his sister. Uh, There's some great flashbacks to them being kids and dealing with this mirror and their parents going crazy and their dad basically, who is the the actor that plays their dad is actually fairly well known. He's been in a fair amount of stuff. Yeah, I can't think of it off the top of my head, Um, but I know. But just fucking awesome ghost story, like ghost story, haunting, whatever you want to call it, cursed mirror done right. You feel for all the characters throughout this, you question whether it's really happening or not. And when, by the time you realize it is, it's too late. And the ending is sad as fuck. It is really sad, actually. Not a happy ending. No. So Oculus, I think, was one of those films that I was like, oh my God, WWE touched this. It's going to be a big piece of shit. And right. it wasn't a piece of shit. It was actually a very great film. So that's why it's at number three on my list. That, that's a great choice. Because yeah, that's a, like I watched that for the first time like on your suggestion. And we also did it for uh, uh, Derek B's show. We and, did, yeah. And they, that was, uh, I, I always avoided it because I was like, oh, this isn't going to be that good of a movie because it's WWE and I'm glad I watched right? it because, yeah, it's actually pretty damn good. <laughs> like WWE putting their name to that was like the worst thing that could have happened because you think it's <laughs> right. going to be a shitty film and it's not. It's actually not a shitty film. It's actually a right. really good film. Yeah. All right. So we are on at number 32. Uh, well, I'm also going with a film that is not funny. Very, very, very heavy. Uh, and it is another 2019 film. And also the other movie we talked about on our very first episode of the podcast, mm. and that is The Nightingale. The Nightingale. Fuck. This movie is heavy, but mm. man, it is so well done. And like it covers colonization, like in such a real, like hard look, like it's in your face and you're going, there's no looking away. You watch this and you just feel awful. And mm-hmm. coming from the woman that directed the Babadook, which was also a heavy film, but man, I didn't expect this from her. Like this one was just the performances all around were absolutely incredible. It the revenge aspect of it, you're just like wanting that revenge for her so bad for everything mm-hmm. that she's been put through, and then like like she is just a good person that is just trying to help and like save others and the aboriginal man that's in this and oh my gosh mm-hmm. like such a hard look at history and like done yeah. in a horror fashion yep like this is more. real life horror like to a t i could not agree more with you scotty it is it is a very intense film uh, it is a very emotionally draining film, but it is fucking incredible. And I believe it's Jennifer Kent. Kent I think Kent, so. That directed this one. Um, same person that did the Babadook. Yep. And Babadook's another excellent fucking film. Actually, yeah. talking about excellent films, Babadook. And I, this film is definitely worth the watch, but I would caution people about the rape scene that's in this. It's a very yeah. realistic rape scene. Uh, it's not like these over sexualized, you know, spit on my grave shit. Spit yeah. on your grave shit. Like it's, it's a very, you know, when it does talk about colonization very well. And um, I don't know, if you're really sensitive about colonization, maybe don't watch this movie because, like, it's true. I don't know. Yeah, like, like, I don't well, know what more proof you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah this, 
this is right. one of those that's it's never an easy watch but like for some i'm noticing there's a trend on my list there's the light-hearted fun and fluffy stuff and then there's the hard-hitting heavy shit that i'm just like why am i watching this but there's a reason it's just because it's so well done but at the same time it's like man <laughs> This is this one will put you through the emotional ringer. It absolutely will. Um, my thirty-two will not. It's called Club Dried two thousand four. <laughs> <laughs> Got to lighten it up a bit. Um, yeah, so we'll come in from Scotty's that movie and talk about Club <laughs> Dread. Uh, Club Dread's just a fucking stupid slasher. It's a comedy. Um, it's based on this island that I talked about in my top five comedies. You've heard me talk about it before, but it's so fucking funny and like they all show up at this island to party and. The guy with the dreads and how they they make fun of Jimmy (laughs) Buffett in it and like the killer scenes and like it's just it's just funny like it's just an overall funny fucking movie and I really recommend if you haven't seen Club Dread to check it out. It is easy to watch a good little horror horror comedy. It's done by uh, who's the group? Uh, Broken Lizard. Broken Lizard. So if you like Super Troopers, you'll probably like you'll probably like Club Dread. It's, it's, it's fun. fun. It is so yeah. much fun. <laughs> We've talked about it before. We don't need to go into great depth with it. Um, but yeah, check it out if you haven't had a chance to. Maybe not the same day you watch The Nightingale. I don't know if that's like <laughs> well, a... Maybe that might be a good thing to do. Watch it after The Nightingale yeah. to just kind of like... It'd be like watching a Disney movie after a really dark horror film. Just to kind of lighten the mood and make you feel yeah. a little better about right. yourself. <laughs> um but yeah that's my 32 so what's your 31st scott my number 31 uh on the year of my birth 1981 (laughs) and my birth uh i want to say the uh, line mommy a naked american man stole my balloons and that is an american werewolf in london (laughs) nice nice (laughs) oh one of the best obviously everyone knows this movie and like the werewolf transformation is the best that's ever been done on screen uh just all around fun funny tragic but man the the characters in this you just love them so much and david you're just wanting it like wanting everything to happen good for him like especially after losing his friend and then the effects that you see what happens to his friend as he's deteriorating and becoming more and more like zombie like and just gross and just disgusting like and the cleverness of the music in this with everything talking about a mo- with every song representing the different phase of the moon basically like it's just very a very well written, fun yet tragic story that in one of my one of like the two John Landis films that I really do enjoy. Like because you know John Landis is a kind of a piece of crap, but mm-hmm. uh, still this movie is incredible and there is a reason it is like one of the best known werewolf films. Agreed, a hundred percent. My thirty one is the Tenant, nineteen seventy six. Nice. Um, one of the few seventies movies besides, I think, Tales of the Crypt that I have on here. Oh no, I haven't. I have another one. Um, but it's just Roman Polanski is great in this film. He really does buy this. Like he's just an immigrant living in this country, trying to survive. Gets into this apartment. And it's basically a cultish experience for him. And it's a very slow dread that's really built on a lot of dialogue and a lot of anxiety. And I think that delivers a very, very good film. So if you haven't had a chance to take, check this out and you're a fan of Roman Polanski, I, I strongly recommend it. Great. A uh, great choice. Like this is still one I need to see. Like, but I've or if I only, I've only heard nothing but praise for this film. I really like it. I think you'll enjoy it, Scott. You like a lot of thinking movies. You're a thinking yeah, man, so I'm you like think. that. Sh- you like that shit. Um. So I know we're at thirty. So I think what I'm what I'm thinking, Scott, is we should go to twenty five today. And what I think we should do is if one of us has said something that's in our top twenty five, we acknowledge it, and then maybe we change it out for when we record the, the bottom 25. Okay. Because like you've said a couple that are already on mine. All right. And then we can um, release it with sharing, or maybe we also say some honorable mentions now that would have made our list, but we just shaved them off as well after we do 25. So say if anything was repeated, like you, I said something that you would have said or vice versa. And then when we record, we could even record next week and try to release these out a little bit quicker um we can replace them with different okay. films does that sound like a plan yeah you like that yeah okay so that was some prepping everyone can hear that so be prepared because scott and i are going to swap out and share what we would have repeated because scott already said four that were on my list in my oh 25. okay 
Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I can't remember if you've said any that are on my top twenty-five yet. Yeah, you said four for me, so I'd want to. Change wow. All right. Mind. Yeah. Um. So my number. Oh, sorry. No, thirty. What's your thirtieth? Oh yeah, my number thirty. Uh, is uh, well, one of uh, to my top five all-time favorite vampire movies, and that is the Swedish film from two thousand and eight. Let the right one in. Very nice, excellent film. Oh man, this movie is just a very serious take on vampirism um and the little girl in this does such an incredible job as a like both performances from the kids in this film are Mm -hmm. incredible and like it's just a great fucking story and it's tragic because you know this little girl is a vampire who's been a vampire for like a hundred years or longer and so like but she's trapped in this body and can only befriend like basically children that she needs like other other children that she basically is looking for to be her caretaker as they get older and like kind of represent the parental figure because obviously being a little girl you can't uh live in your own place by yourself you have to have an adult and so like it's a very tragic kind of love story in a way but almost a love story out of necessity it's awesome it's a great fucking film and it's a it's a a swedish film um and it's yet again another example of an international film that really pulls on the heartstrings um it's a really really good concept of a child vampire and i want to read the book one of these days because i do have the audiobook and i just have not got around to it yet but i heard it's really good uh, I think the original book was and like that. And like, they got they translated. Did. Yep. You're not going to read the Swedish version. I may just to see what I can figure. All out. I can think of is the Swedish chef from <laughs> birdie, 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 birdie. right, which is not Swedish, <laughs> just so we're clear. Um, I just don't know how to speak Swedish. So, nope. <laughs> uh, my thirtieth is a 2019 film, and it was based off a series of short story books that came out in the 90s, and mm. I think it was one of the best adaptations. And I'm foaming at the mouth for a sequel, people. When are you going to get a sequel out? And that is scary stories to tell in the dark. Um, one of the one of the fucking best movies that came out in 2019. It was so good. The kids in this were amazing. The artwork that they applied from the books in this was amazing. The stories they chose were amazing. Oh my, like I just, I have nothing but praise for this movie. I just think this movie is out of this world good. And I just, I cannot wait for a sequel. If you love scary yeah. stories to tell in the dark as a kid, you will love the fucking movie. So please, please, please check it out. Yeah, this movie did a great job of bringing the books to life. And, you know, Andre o- Overdahl, that's the second time he, uh, one of his films has been mentioned tonight because Autopsy of Jane Doe was his very first film, like that, at least I remember. And wow. to see him do that, then do uh, scary t- stories to tell in the dark, it's like, wow, yeah, you've come a long ways. And like, like completely different style of horror. And I love it. Like, and he does right? a great job. Honestly, it's so good. So good. Um, the next one is, oh yeah, so 29, 29 yep. for you. All right. So number 29 is a Stephen King adaptation where I said I would be bringing up Frank Darabont again, the director, because this man does seem to do a great job of uh, bringing Stephen King's books to life. And this one was even said by Stephen King that if he would have thought of this ending, he would have changed it to and changed it in his book. Uh, and that movie is The Mist from 2007. Yeah, man, that's a fucking heavy film. Oh, man. Like, it's heavy, but at the same time, like, such an awesome, like, Lovecraftian creature feature horror film. Like, the monsters in this are just absolutely terrifying and weird and out of this world. And, like... And it like that, you know, that's the part that, you know, Scotty gravitates towards is the creature feature. Mm -hmm. And also I gravitate towards the human conditioning and like, or human behaviors and how -hmm. people will react when like stuck in a situation like this, where they cannot leave and they are forced to work alongside each other. And Mm -hmm. like, when you have one, that's a righteous psychotic zealot, that's just, oh man, oh like the shit she like the cult she pretty much builds with these people in this grocery store and the shit she ends up having them do like just crazy. Is heart it's crazy and heartbreaking and not far from the truth of what how people would no, react none of it is far from the truth and i think that's the scariest thing yeah and then you know there, there's all this in the story and then you get to that fucking ending where it's just the father, son, and the two other survivors that have escaped the grocery store, and they like are pretty much trapped in the middle of the mist, realizing that there is no end to the mist, 
and they fucking he kills his own son and kills them and then runs out of ammo and can't kill himself and then he's stuck living and then the mist starts clearing because the fucking army shows up and start and like then he's forced to live with what he just did when they were just that fucking close to surviving right right oh right. it is such a fucking gut punch of an ending and, it is but man what an amazing horror film like the creatures in it alone are worth like watching because it's just so they're like so freaking cool and unique and alien and yeah this is mm -hmm. like a lovecraft story and it's done by stephen king and he it got turned a short story turned into a full length movie and like man so well done absolutely i couldn't agree more it's a fucking phenomenal film and a sad 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 ending yeah um my 29th is maniac we already talked about it um, nice. i don't know if we need to you know talk about it more uh but it is an excellent movie maniac from 1980 uh the original so what is your 28, Scott? Uh, my 28 is coming from 2012, and it is definitely a relationship-based horror film, and that is The Battery. Uh, a relationship-based horror film and the fact that two people are stuck surviving together in a zombie apocalypse with no one else around and the deterioration of like dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis, just trying to survive and the whole argument of one wants to stay in like one place and live when the other is like, no, we got to continue moving. If we mm -hmm. don't, we are dead. And like, and then just what they go through together. It is such a well-written, like well-acted fucking movie. And the director, you know, who also directed After Midnight. And, and also starred in it. And yeah, and starred in both these films. And he's just incredible. And like, man, like you just feel for these characters and what they're going through. and. It is mm -hmm. such a well, well done, well made film. I couldn't agree more, Scotty. Um, and you'll find out why in a little bit. <laughs> um, my 28 was a movie that really hit me emotionally. It was the ending to the point where I can't watch the ending again. I get to the tail ending and then I have to like shut it off because I know what's going to happen. And that is Eden Lake 2008. <sighs> Ooh, um yeah. it is such a good fucking film it's i believe an aussie film uh or is I it think an it, english film i think it might be aussie and it is so fucking sad what happens yeah. to this couple and the kids in it are fucking evil and you feel real bad for that chick the main character in this movie and when you get to the end and you think she's going to be okay and things are not okay it's a gut punch it's a real gut punch and uh, I watched it for the first time. I think it was either last year or the year before. I can't remember. And it's really stuck with me. It stayed in the back of my mind and it's embedded there. And that's why it's on my list at number 28. Such a heavy film again, but so well done. So well done, right? Yeah. And that, and there, like you said, that ending. Whew. Gut punch. Real yeah. Gut punch. Well, now this one is more of a, an emotional film for me that means a lot to me for like in my life. And that is a, another Stephen King adaptation directed by John Carpenter, 1983's Christine. Yeah. Like, and this is your 27, just so we're clear. Yes. With everyone, 27. Yep, number 27, sorry. But yeah, uh, Christine is a movie that is near and dear to my heart for anybody that doesn't know. I think I've talked about it on the show before, but my brother had passed away about five years ago, and this was his all-time favorite movie. We've watched it growing up as kids. We've watched it so many times because he loved it. And on his birthday and on his, the day that he passed, I usually have a drink in his honor and watch this movie. I love this movie to, like, I love this movie to death. It is something that will be a part of my life for the rest of my life. I will have it in any format that it is available. And like this, for one, it's my dream car. I do want a fucking, uh, I think it's a 56 Plymouth. I want this fucking car so bad. And I want it, Chris, I want it to look exactly like Christine because it's so beautiful but this movie covers addiction and yep. like obsession and yep. like does it in a very great, great way. Obviously, you know, the whole concept, Oh, killer car. I hear the concept. Oh, well, yeah, just like hop a fence, run away. Like, you know, get off the road. Yeah. That's obviously what you should do, but that's not what this film's about. Well, like, and that's not is... what the killer car is not about it killing other people. It's about taking over Arnie. Yeah. You're right. It's about addiction and obsession. Yeah. Like that's the true evil of this movie. Exactly. Right. Like that's really, you know, run away from the car. Fuck's sakes. Right. Like, I mean, obviously there is the one scene with the lead bully that he's just 
running down the street as Christina's on fire and he's just running straight down the road. It's like, okay, dude, yeah, zigzag, do something yeah, if you want to survive. Be but panicking, right? Like yeah. you wouldn't know what to think. Honestly, I I personally think that criticism is just it's to be it's crit- a it's just yeah. to criticize. Like sometimes people criticize movies just for the sake of looking smart. Yeah. And I think that's honestly because I I honestly don't think when you have things like a talking car um a doll that comes to life you know a killer pair of jeans if we look at slacks you're not expecting for any of that to happen okay i don't put on my pair of jeans and think it's gonna fucking right embody me or embalm me like honestly like get the fuck out of here like it, it's a fucking classic movie and there's no way that if a car came alive and didn't chase you you wouldn't be shitting your pants so like right. you wouldn't be thinking clearly enough to be like oh man how can i outsmart this car that wouldn't be a thing not a thing right not especially especially a car that is on fire at the end of in that yeah, scene which, like which and is... also the year this came out like yeah it's not like now where you have self-driving cars like right. it's you know i think people just need to chill out yep and like <laughs> Right. And also, like, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, too, is the use of the 50s music in this is oh, so representative and ties into everything that's going on in the movie. Like, Christine, yeah. the car itself has its own fucking personality, which is, when you can make an inanimate object have a, have its own personality, that is saying something. And, it's talent. Yeah. And, yeah, obviously, John Carpenter scoring this and directing it, like, the man's a fucking master. And but yeah, this movie, while not one of his best films, is always going to be near and dear to my heart, and it will always be in my rotation yearly. It's awesome, Scotty. I'm really happy to hear that. I know how much it means to you. Yeah, um, and I'm sure your brother would be very happy to hear that you put it on the list. Um, so mine is not an older film like that, and it doesn't have the bells and whistles or the legacy. I would say a handful of people watched it because it came out in the theaters in 2020 last year. And I feel like the only reason it got the play it did was because it was 2020 or, or 2020. Yeah. 2020. And there wasn't like two years ago, two years ago, fuck, yeah. <laughs> two years ago. And it was because we were in the middle of a pandemic and that was come play and nice. come play to me. The, first of all, finally an appropriate reflection of what autism is. Thank you movies for now actually taking mental health and um, neurological disorders and presenting them in a way that makes sense. Thank you. Um, right. It is, it is, you know, 2022 and we should be doing that. Um, and this movie with this little boy, you just feel so <laughs> bad for this kid and this creature that stalks him is scary as fuck. And there's some really good suspenseful scenes in this movie. The relationship between him and his mom and his dad is really good. His dad's not a deadbeat. Like his dad, you kind of get the impression that the marriage has fallen apart, but his dad isn't a piece of shit. Like his dad obviously really loves his son. Um, and there's just a whole lot of different dynamics that happen here. And you feel really sorry for the entity as well, because the entity is very lonely. And it kind of talks about how lonely you can be in the world when you have the ability to connect with everybody. Yeah. And it was a it was a sleeper hit, in my opinion. Um, the people that I did recommend it to either made their top 20 lists or was an honorable mention. So it's a good film. And I recommend watching it for people who haven't seen it yet. And that's Come Play 2020. Yeah, this film was uh, one that I was very happy to have gotten the chance to see in theaters. Great movie. Yeah, and, Great I, yeah. Movie. and I'm, it's unfortunate that it happened during the pandemic because it probably would have got a lot more, a lot more would recognition. It, um, I think it would have. I think it would have. Hence the Night House last year. Well, I mean, also still pandemic. Yeah, I think, I know, Scott, you're so much nicer than I am, but I think we still have a lot of horror fans that will only go see franchises or big things that are splashy. Oh, like, yeah. you know, you get these great, not as well-known movies that come out and people just are like, oh, wow, well, it's not for forever part. Oh, wow, well, it's not happening right. 18. You know, like, and they just skip over it and they don't realize the good that can be out there. Um, it's got some much more pre- optimistic person than I am. He's like, <laughs> Optimus Prime, and I'm like <laughs> Negatron. I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm, I'm optimistic Prime. Optimistic Prime. Um, so we're gonna do our 26, and then we're gonna go over any other movies that maybe could, we're just you know scaling our top 50 that we may want to shout out. And then I have a bunch that Scott said that I now have to oh, wow. get rid of and say <laughs> the numbers that they were at. So Scott, why don't you see us you know towards closing this part one of our top 50? Uh, with your number 26. All right. So, I mean, what, what would a top 50 list be without having at least at least one Vincent Price film in the first chunk of this uh, podcast? 
and that is one of my one of my favorites of his from 1959 william castle's directed house on haunted hill great film oh man i love this film so much it is so it is definitely like you know cheese cheese but at the same time like it's a good spooky movie for the time and you know anything vincent price is in man's a fucking auteur more and like the toxic relationship that him and his wife are in while it's like oh, man, a horrible it's, it's a horrible relationship but man like the, the the dialogue between them is just so just dark such dark comedy remember that time you tried to poison me oh that was good times <laughs> and stuff like that it's like man and like just the snide remarks they have towards each other over and over and over again in this and it's just it's just such a fun film from that time. And I agree. One that I watch every single year. And like, I just love Vincent Price in this so much. And yeah, like, I, I don't know what else to say because I've, this movie's a classic. I've talked about it a billion times before, but yeah, love this movie to death. That's awesome. I'm really glad that you brought that. I know how much you love Vincent Price and that yeah. film because I bought you the shirt. You did. For your birthday in 2020. Um, so my movie is a franchise movie. It is Friday the 13th, part four, 1984. Oh, nice. I absolutely love this movie. I think it's universally loved. I think it's one of the top. A lot yes. of people really like this film. It's either their second or their third. Um, average speaking. Well, actually, course, right? most people, it's their first. Really? Mm-hmm. I thought the second or the first would be their first. Uh, a lot of people seem to think part four is the best, which mm-hmm. I am very, yeah, that we may be talking about that in a second. Yeah, it is a great film um, for many reasons. I think that you get the character of Tommy. Um, Tommy, right? Tommy. Yep. Yeah, I'm like getting tired, right? So getting... <laughs> and his little makeup stuff that he does. And they carry that on really well into the fifth one, actually. Um, with that character of doing the masks and stuff like oh, yeah. that. that They do kind of connect really well. Um, and him just with his sister. And you really want these two people to fucking make it. Like you really, really, really do. And I think it would have been really interesting if they went with him being the new Jason. I think that would have been a really interesting concept. It's cool that they didn't. Um, but I thought that this film was awesome. The The kills were awesome. The relentless of Jason keeping coming and coming. And this little kid being the one that outsmarts him is fucking awesome. And that's why I think it deserves to be number 26. Well, it also deserves to be number 26 because of the amazing dance moves by Crispin Glover. Well, you know, how could you go wrong, right? <laughs> and this um, has probably some of the most likable characters in the franchise. Like, uh, you know, th- let me let me check the computer. Oh, the computer says you're a dead fuck. And just like, that's, it's like pretty there's, funny, right? Yeah, there's so many great characters and great lines in this movie. Was this on your list? Yes, this was... Uh, what number was it? Uh, let me look, but this was number 14. Number 14. So Scott will have to replace his number 14. Um, Which is fine. I already got it replaced in my head. Awesome. Is there any other movies you wanted to shout out, Scott, that you were going to put on your list, but you didn't? Uh, Yeah, a few I will bring up. Um, Let's see. Got to give some love to the Italian gore hound, gore maestro himself, Lucio Falci. And yep. talk, I want to talk about the uh, Gates of Hell trilogy. So the Beyond, City of the Living Dead, and House by the Cemetery. Like those movies are all just fantastic, weird, abstract, and like obviously House by the Cemeteries. Bob. Huh? Bob. Oh, fucking Bob. I want to kick him in the face so bad. <laughs> House Bob by the Cemetery is obviously the weakest of the three, but and City of the Living Dead for me is my all-time favorite. Uh, but yeah, those movies are all fucking fantastic. And then, of course, Suspiria. Suspiria! Witch! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm talking about 1977 Suspiria. Not- yeah, that was also one of my honorable mentions too, Scotty. Yep, and then, of course, Psycho, the original. Yeah, yeah, good one. Uh, the Like, um, let's see, one more that I have on this list, and that would be uh, Theater of Blood by Vin- from with another Vincent Price movie. Awesome. Uh, an actor that is basically uh, getting screwed by the critics and he gets revenge. And he, you can tell Vincent Price just has a fucking blast with this role playing different characters for each person that he's killing. That's awesome. I uh, I haven't seen that one. I'll have to check it out. 
um for me the ones that scotty just shows how good his taste is is we are still here with my 21 nice um we talked about that already i won't go into any more detail the battery was my number 19 wow uh uh, potty pool was my number 18 oh wow (laughs) um and american werewolf in london was number 16 for me Holy crap, so I'm just taking all the ones in order there. <laughs> That's why I was like, well, we're going to have to definitely, because we had talked about going straight through, but the show's already been over two hours. And, yeah. um, you know, people may want to break this up in chunks when they're listening. And also, like, I need to pick a bunch <laughs> of new movies because Scott said a bunch of them, um, which is good. It just shows. And, you know, of course, he said Maniac already as well. And I know there's going to be one that he's going to say. Um, I may even, yeah. Hmm. We can talk afterwards and find out. Okay, okay. And then ones that could have made my list, but I just kept them off by the skin of their teeth is Crimson Peak 2015. Oh, good Um, movie. Really great. I love the sex scene. Like, I don't know why I find that sex scene so hot, but like, (laughs) she's wearing like a corset and shit. And like, it's like that, like, they've been kind of denying themselves for so long. And then they consummate their marriage. And it's just like, probably because I like sex so much too. Like, I was just... (laughs) like me denying myself and then really wanting to bang a lot um it's it's true though like it's true like that's one of my new year's resolutions was to get more d so like that's definitely (laughs) something i'm hoping to do this year anybody anybody (laughs) crickets 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 jesus (laughs) shoot your shot if you see them or shoot your load no no it's there's a song by lizzo that goes tell your friends shoot your shot if you see him too late he's already in my dms <laughs> oh good lord my dms no one it's ghosted it's ghost town ghost town it's like a parent paranormal investigators are coming to investigate soon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'm just kidding but i'm not all right so maf was my other one from 2017 i know there's lots of debate whether m f sorry mfa oh nice yeah i don't know if this is a true out horror movie but i watched it on exploding heads i talked about it there and it's really stuck with me since and talk about a movie i went 360 or 180 on fucking the blair witch project 1999 oh wow yeah like never in a million years would i be like oh man now it's on my list but i'm like i fucking respect the shit out of that movie now like i <laughs> i totally gone completely the other way on it you mentioned Suspiria, Suspiria, Suspiria. <laughs> lights here flashy music um martyrs 2008 nice really really good film uh the fly 1980 i feel like we may hear that movie next week maybe uh maybe and then the night house 2021 nice so that is a movie that's going to be sticking with me um and i'm glad you mentioned child's play as well that was something else that i had um so yeah that's our first half of our top 50 personal horror movies uh, at this point, you know, what we've watched. It's funny, I, when we did that 100 movie list for Exploding Heads, my list looks completely different now. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. completely different, right? Because of just watching more movies. Yeah, same. Right? Like, that um, was before we really dived into our first-time watches like we have. That was <laughs> that was back in the day. You that know? was a long time ago. It was long ago, and it was far away. Oh, rest <laughs> in peace, Meatloaf, by the way. Meatloaf passed away. Everybody oh, yes. About this. Mm. Meatloaf was my... One of my saving graces when I was a young Heather and still is today, because um, rock and roll dreams come true for yeah, you. But now, and now he can live in the paradise and the dashboard lights. He sure can, man. And you know what? You have your music and your talent and your art to follow you for the rest of your life. That's the best thing that you can do. Like us, I'm sure the five listeners will always remember <laughs> us <laughs> in their we hearts. Are, we are forever in your memory forever so we will be back probably maybe we'll try to release these sooner depends how much editing scott has to do and maybe we'll try to release them back to back scotty like one week like this end of next coming friday and then another next coming friday just because they're complimentary we'll see what his schedule's like right Um, because he's the one that does the editing (laughs) (laughs) we'll see we'll see what he has time to do though i don't think this one will be too hard because there's no real chance stamps it's just like no no here's the list yeah, here's the list. Like there might be like one or two timestamps, like an introduction, and then when we get into the list. Yeah, right. And and then that's it. So again, Scott and I thank you for coming on this ride with us. Um, it's been a it's been a slice. We'll be back with episode 51, where we're going to talk about our top 25 horror movies of all time. Now that you know, I have to replace four of them. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to have to go back to my list and really think about 
um, some other movies that I've seen that I didn't put on there that, you know, I did, I did make some hard calls actually. And uh, I, I left some off. So now I'm going to have to think about where I want to put them. Yeah. And this, I will say right now, my top 10 is pretty much, well, I'd say probably like my top 15 is pretty much cemented in stone at this point, but everything from 16 to 50 probably could have been, it could be completely different. Like this, this list like could change any given day. Cause there's just so many movies and I probably forgot some when I was making this list, but yep, these are the ones that came up and I'm very proud to have them on my list to represent, but yeah, this, this list represent. could always change. Represent yo, yo. <laughs> so thank you again for joining for Scott, joining Scott and I on our journey. Uh, we look forward to giving you the rest of our list. Uh, coming up with our next episode so until next time what do you have to say to the good people scotty until next time kitties (laughs) pleasant dreams see ya